Uh, would the secretary, Yolanda, would you, or uh, whomever, uh, would you please call roll? And we'll see if we have a quorum. Heidi Amberlin. Yeah. Heidi Amberlin. No. Okay. Len Filippo. Filippo. No. Adrian Fine. Daniel Garber. Annette Glankoff. Jennifer Hederly. Jennifer Hederly. Uh, Arthur Keller, Shawnee Kleinhaus, Lydia Ku, Stephen Levy, Don McDougall, Whitney McNair, Julia Moran, Mark Nadim, Bonnie Packer. Lisa? Is she here? Okay. <laughs> Doria Suma? Here. Amy Sung? Here. And Jason Titus? Here. Elaine Wang? Here. Ellen Ubrook? Here. Alex Van Riesen? Here. Bob Wenzelou. Wenzelau. Oh. No. <laughs> Hamilton Oh yes, sorry, sorry about that. Yolanda, have you completed? Have you completed the roll? I yes. count sixteen. <laughs> I think that's right. We have a quorum. Uh, we will move forward. Now is the time that we would have members from the public speak at oral communications. We have two cards. If you would like to speak, uh, please present a card. Uh, the first speaker will be Betty Jo Chang, followed by Esther Nygaard. Betty Jo, you'll have three minutes. Uh, and pl yes, please that, use that speaker right there. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, thank you for your efforts on this plan element. It's made a big progression since the last time I read it, and I really appreciate the time you've put into it. I just had a couple of comments. I did put a, have a, do have a handout with more of the reasons why. Um, on item two, S281, page S20, the flood mitigation requirements, um, I'd like you to consider adding to this policy S281 a recommendation that Municipal Code 16.2, the um, city's flood hazard regulations, be also applied to those areas on your map S6 of sea level rise uh, in residential areas that are within that 55 inch sea level rise should have um, the Muni Code Regulation 16.2 attached to it as well. This will have the effect of proactively reducing construction of residential basement dwellings in areas where we know we may expect more flooding during uh, the practical lifetime of residential construction. This decoupled Palo Alto's health and safety concerns from the often glacial responses of a property insurance mechanism such as FEMA. We have to remember that FEMA is about property damage and this plan is about health and safety of our citizens. The second item, uh, S282, page S20 also. Uh, thank you for continuing to participate in the community rating program and for looking at perhaps improving our rating one more notch because that may reduce the cost of voluntary health uh, flood insurance in these areas that are going to be prone to increased flooding as a result of climate change. Um, Item S283, also on the same page, uh, partnering with appropriate agencies to uh, um, expand flood zones as appropriate due to channel creek changes and sheet flooding, da-da-da. Uh, please add, 
consider adding to that policy again the recommendation that Muni Code 16.2 be added to applied to all those areas indicated on your map as six for sea level rise. Program S9 on page S21, prevent new habitable basements as a part of residential development in areas within the flood hazard zone. Uh, we have to remember that all of Palo Alto is in some risk of flooding. Please consider adding prohibition of new habitable basements as part of single family and multifamily residential neighborhoods within the sea level rise and dam inundation map areas on maps S6 and S7. Finally, program S29, study appropriate restrictions on groundwater construction where the groundwater is 14 feet or less to accommodate expected high water levels. Please consider adding a deadline for this study report of no later than 24 months from adoption of the comprehensive plan. Time is of the essence in this regard. And thank you again for your time and your contribution to the city. Thank you. Esther Nygaard, uh, if there's anyone else that would like to speak, please give us a card. Oh, I'm sorry, Nagenda, I apologize. That's all right. Um, uh, good evening, everybody. I just wanted to bring to your attention the water energy climate nexus, which I believe is not uh, mentioned in this plan so far. Um, the water energy climate nexus is a ma major theme in climate change adaptation these days. Uh, California's water sector consumes nearly 20% of the state's electricity and 30% of its natural gas, and its needs are growing. The water sector uses, <laughs> I'm done? <laughs> okay. The water sector uses electricity to pump, treat, transport, deliver, and heat water. Expected increases in groundwater pumping, water treatment, and water recycling mean the energy intensity of water will grow. But water does not only consume energy, it is an important player in the generation of power. And heading into the future, we expect climate change will add additional stress on the availability of water for both potable use and energy production. For California and Palo Alto to meet its climate goals, we need to rethink the role that water plays as a significant electricity consumer and producer. Water and energy are symbiotically relying on each other to be produced and delivered, and in the face of climate change, they are inherently impacted together, and it becomes imperative that one cannot be addressed without the other. Some possible goals to adapt to climate change and reduce greenhouse gases, as suggested in a paper from the Department of Energy, include the following. First, optimize the energy efficiency of water management, treatment, distribution, and end use systems. Second, enhance the reliability and resilience of energy and water systems. Third, increase safe and productive use of non-traditional water sources. Fourth, promote responsible energy operations with respect to water quality, ecosystem, and seismic impacts. And fifth, exploit productive synergies among water and energy systems. I believe Palo Alto already has some of these goals and or some programs that address some of these goals. However, in my opinion, the energy water climate nexus remains to be acknowledged more explicitly in our plans. Thank you. Thank you. Staff, I believe we have a recap of the November 28th City Council meeting on the draft land use element. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> thank you. Um, and I, I really wanted to be uh, brief here. I don't know how many of you were able to watch, but some of the CAC members were actually at the meeting. It was a long conversation with the city council about the land use element. Uh, Elaine and Elena were there, and Joanna were there to help give a brief presentation of all the work the CAC had done in putting together dra the draft element and then also transmitting uh, all of the comments uh, that were in the council's packet. I think uh, safe to say the city council appreciated all of uh, your efforts. They gave us a lot of comments. It was very diffuse. I mean, they didn't get to the point where they could narrow down and sort of get to decisions uh, yet. 
uh, but I think we set the stage for a productive meeting the next time we go to council, which we're planning to do at the end of January, where we'll actually ask them to make choices between the options uh, in the growth management area, the height limit area, and the others that you articulated in the land use element. So I think we're well positioned for that discussion. It will be a, a meeting of uh, where the council gets both the land use element and the transportation element. So they can also see the synergies between the two of them. And we don't have a, a definite date yet. We're tentatively on the calendar for uh, the 30th of January, uh, but I will let you know if that changes. We're actually kind of hoping they set aside a whole day for this discussion instead of trying to cram it into a, a late Monday evening, but we'll see if we can prevail on the new council to make that happen. Uh, then just uh, one more thank you to all of you for your uh, efforts this year, uh, and not just to the committee, but to the staff and consultants. We've all put in a tremendous amount of work, uh, and to the public. We have some religious attendees who, who have shared their thoughts with us throughout this uh, year, and I appreciate all of that. Uh, we put in a lot of work. I think we have a lot to show for it, uh, and we're getting very close to the end on this project. So, uh, you know, we have good we have good momentum. It's uh, It's been really, really terrific. And of course, a special thanks to Adrian, Lydia, and Doria, who are moving on to uh, other assignments. Uh, luckily, I think they will all be in a position uh, to help us get this work done in their new roles. Um, and uh, hopefully, uh, we will, uh, at the in 2017, uh, see a conclusion uh, to this process. Uh, anyway, that's, that's all I have. Okay. Speaking of a conclusion to this process, and of, um, you know, we did this, this turnaround was shorter because of the holidays, so there were a couple of little glitches in terms of what went out. Um, there was a page, I think it was page seven, that said the next steps, and it gives a colon, and if you turn to the next page, there were no next steps. <laughs> so that doesn't mean you're done. That just meant that um, at places is, are that list of next steps um, and the list of appendices. And basically what we're looking for is in January, we will be at the meeting on business and economics and we will be, we have been um, asking members of that subcommittee to let us know their availability for a subcommittee meeting on either January 5th or 6th so that we can have a subcommittee meeting before we hear it um, in mid-January. And the other dates that are on here um, as well. It's really quite, as Hillary said, it's quite a remarkable achievement that we had really pushed. A lot of you have worked really hard to get these two elements done tonight so that we could have the majority, well, we could have almost everybody um, on, the original sub, on the original CAC here for the final action on this. So we only have one more element to go which is business and economics, and then we have some work on implementation and some work on um, governance and the user's guide, and we will be done, and it will move on. So if you, both the schedule, the monthly schedule, and this set of next steps, um, which was actually page 10, um, are at your asked places, also at your places. Any questions on the schedule or how we're gonna move ahead? Um, and also at places are the comments that were received from CAC members and the comments that were received from Betty Jo. Betty Jo brought her comments tonight and the other comments are all stapled together. So that is what is at your at places. And with that, we were gonna let Dan had some comments to make too. As one of the co-chairs, uh, we also wanted to add our special thanks to, uh, to Lydia and Adrian, who uh, are attending their last meeting of the CAC. I am so sorry for that. You would have had such a better time here. <laughs> uh, Lydia's not with us, but hopefully she'll, she'll get the message. But congratulations again, uh, and we will look forward to your good work um, on the council. Uh, also, thank you, Lisa. Uh, we also wanted to give a special thank you to Doria, and this is her last meeting. However, we are hoping that she might uh, come and visit us as a representative of the PTC uh, in the coming year, and we'll find out if that happens or not. 
Either do we, but we're, we're dancing to the rain gods here, so. Uh, and then finally, Heidi, who is not here this evening, we also wanted to extend a, a special thank you, and hopefully she will continue her participation uh, as a citizen and through oral communications and, and uh, the other modes of communication that we have available to ourselves. In any case, thank you, uh, one and all, for all of that. Um, let us get to our agenda items. We want to take action on the safety element. Uh, does, and, uh, one moment, I will do that in a second. Um, did uh, staff have any comments uh, to lead us into the safety element, or do we want to go directly to? Okay. Okay, and then uh, just before we go, I want to acknowledge that Whitney McNair joined us uh, to add to the, to the list. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. So the first element on our agenda tonight is the safety element, and uh, this element is coming back to you. It has not gone to the subcommittee since the last time you saw it, so this is an element that incorporates your changes that we discussed when we were here on November 15th. Uh, and I think at the by the time of November 15th, we um, we're pretty far along in this element due to the uh, hard and very knowledgeable uh, hard work and, and knowledge of our subcommittee members and the participation of staff from the police department and the Office of Emergency Services and Public Works and um, IT. So uh, a lot of upfront work went into getting the element into good shape enough that um, we were able to make a series of, uh, for the most part, pretty minor cleanups and clarifications and additions based on your conversation last time. So I think one of the most significant changes that you've probably recognized was that this element was reorganized based on our discussion. Uh, and I think um, the trigger for this was the discussion of water-related policies in the Previously, this element included a section on infrastructure, and within that infrastructure section, there were sections on um, water, wastewater, stormwater, et cetera. And um, CAC members pointed out that a lot of those policies were very closely related to the policies about creeks and water resources in the natural environment element. So we took a closer look at that, and we were able to reorganize those policies and programs and combine a lot of the water-related policies and programs into the natural environment element. That kind kind of started to dissolve our infrastructure goal as a whole. So we've moved the pieces of what used to be an infrastructure goal into various um, other places. The section on power is now found under community safety because that was really about maintaining a safe and reliable grid during uh, emergencies. And the uh, section on solid waste has been moved to be a part of a goal about human-caused threats along with hazardous materials as has uh, cybersecurity. Um, so with that, we kind of dissolved the infrastructure goal. And the other um, piece that was moved within this element is that there used to be a goal five about emergency management, which was really about um, specifically responding and kind of this disaster response type of role. And that has become now part of goal S1, community safety, again, in response to the CAC discussion that we had last month. So some reorganization here. I, I thought the element worked really well once we made these changes. Hopefully you guys feel the same. Um, that's one of the most substantive things that we've done since the last time you saw it. And then under, so there's three goals in this element now, just briefly under each um, one of them. The staff report details the changes, but I'll just mention some of them. Under goal S1, I think one thing um, that we didn't get quite right was uh, this program about emergency drills. I think that should have been changed to be about emergency service uh, volunteers. Um, and so we certainly can clarify that uh, in the next round. Um, and thank you for those of you who pointed that out. We've, we have added a little bit more about engaging the business community, not only in disaster preparedness, but also in recovery plans. We've mentioned the use of urban design principles to increase um, safety and the role of block preparedness coordinators. Um, one thing I wanted to note that's not mentioned in your staff report, it, rather than an addition, was a deletion. There was a program last time about um, proactively identifying offenders uh, before a crime has occurred, and I think that made a, a lot of 
folks nervous about profiling and the appropriateness of such a program. And I think while it might have had good intentions, we realized that that was probably flawed and that program is not here anymore. So that's been removed in response to those concerns. <clears throat> of course, there are still um, programs, many programs about working with the police department and um, specifically transparency and communication about police um, strategies, as well as satellite police locations. Goal two is about natural hazards, so specifically earthquakes and geological hazards and flood hazards, uh, as well as um, fire hazards. And these policies were changed to uh, clarify um, seismic rehabilitation in some policies where the rehabilitation wasn't specified. Uh, a new policy to encourage or support neighborhoods that do want to pursue an effort to um, pool resources for seismic retrofit efforts, um, clarifying uh, the program about sunset dates for TDR programs that would um, incentivize seismic retrofits, and uh, adding a reference to the Baylands Master Plan in terms of um, whenever the city is, is considering shoreline development as part of flood control or flood prevention projects. And then finally, under human cost threats, probably one of the major topics that we changed under this goal had to do with um, groundwater contamination uh, and ongoing kind of refinements to the policies and programs about basements and basement construction. Uh, in addition, we made some changes to the uh, program about telecommunications to replace high, or excuse me, to replace maximum with the word high and clarify in the uh, program S3.12.3 about the Wi-Fi network. Uh, we removed the specific reference to off-grid. So again, in my opinion, kind of really rather minor changes in terms of the policies and programs themselves. And definitely interested to hear your comments on the safety element. Thank you. Thank you. Can I have members of the uh, subcommittee, the safety subcommittee, speak first? If you would, if those that would like to speak would put their cards up. Hamilton, followed by Annette, uh, followed by Don. Go ahead, Hamilton. Sure. I think the changes that the staff made have actually worked out really well. I like the new organization. So I think that was a big win. It feels more dense and more organized. So thank you on that. And in general, the element looks good. There are a couple of little things that I think staff can clean up after this meeting before it gets presented to council, but I don't see any reason to have another subcommittee meeting at this point. Um, yeah, do make 100% sure you correct S113 because we've brought it up a couple of times before. Um, and other than that, I think, um, and the, the diagram still needs some work because I was looking at... Um, the flood diagram, and I'm like, there are whole neighborhoods that were <laughs> flooded in the Duvenick, St. Francis, and Crescent Park area that aren't covered in that diagram, and that was only like a 50-year flood, approximately. Um, so I know that th I think it needs a little bit more, and it, the map needs a little bit more detail, and, and just in general, the diagrams. The earthquake one was kind of confusing, too, but that was the first time we've seen the diagrams. They're the right subject matter. Just a little bit more detail would be great. And again, I don't think there's any reason that these changes can't be handled uh, solely by staff. And I, I feel like the elements really come together, so thank you. Thank you, Annette, and then Don. Well, my comments are going to echo Hamilton's, but first of all, let me say thank you for our little goodie and for dinner and for all the good work. And the, the element is um, coming together. I would echo um, the comment that was already made about the drills, and I know staff also responded to that, and I, <clears throat> in my notes, included some sample wording. Um, on the topic of seismic encouraging neighborhoods to pool resources, the city already does or had a program to do that, so I think also the city could, we could also add, the city could be the agent that does the pooling. Um, it's just that's sort of a note. Um, when we talk about habitable basements, which is policy S29, rather than the word um, prevent new habitable basements within the flood zone, I think we should say prohibit 
<clears throat> I think the Save Palo Alto Groundwater has made it very clear uh, on that point. Um, I'm not sure how you would do code enforcement on that, which has always been my button, but I, I like the word prohibit rather than prevent. And then <clears throat> on policy S215, 15, about the fire department's efforts in education, rather than support these efforts, I would use the word expand expand the fire department's efforts in public education. I know that's something they want to do, but currently the major focus is in the fire areas and the foothills. So with that, I think it really looks good. I also think the maps in this section and the natural environment section need to be tightened up. The graphics, the, the, the text need to be increased. I mean, you have to use a microscope to actually look at them. and. Um, I'm glad that we include all many of the key maps that were included in Thyra in the um, in that whole process, threats analysis, et cetera. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Don. The, the, the first thing I want to do is compliment both Annette and Hamilton for their leadership on this uh, subcommittee. In fact, they, they they did a tremendous job of of reviewing everything in detail. Mm -hmm. I, I like what was done here. Um, I think that there's actually been more impact on this than is implied. Um, the, the suggestion that this was, you know, tweaking it, I think that there's real, real interesting content. Uh, and presentation. I think the idea that it's now safety and natural uh, impacts and man-made impacts uh, really clarifies what we're trying to deal with. I like the idea that we added uh, prepare, mitigate, and recover, as opposed to just business continuity in the business section. Uh, I like the connection to the Baylands Master Plan. I think that was really important. I think uh, Hamilton's point about the 100-year flood, uh, I think there's a map somewhere that shows the 100-year 100, 100 flood area, and it's different than this one, and, and so I think we need to deal with that, and I would encourage uh, I, I like an, uh, like Hamilton. I don't believe we need another subcommittee, but I would encourage the basement and groundwater uh, a review of that to maybe tighten it up. I think there's still a great deal of angst about that, um, and um, there's lots of good technology uh, from Esri and people like that with maps and. I think relying on the fact that the maps look great when they're in color, but they don't look so great when they're uh, when they're in black and white, and when they look great when they're on a 25 by 48 sheet, but they don't look so great when they're on an eight and a half by 11 sheet. Um, there could be some some focus on that just for uh, presentation purposes. But again, uh, I'd like to thank and compliment uh, Hamilton and Annette. Thank you. Is there other discussion from other members? If you would put your cards up, Bonnie. We just go around. We just go I, around I think we may only have one person that is interested in speaking. Bonnie, go ahead. Okay, um, oh, I just I had won. very couple small things. Uh, policy um, S.6, protect the privacy and civil liberties, not just of residents, but of all persons. And with with that in mind, last night around 10.30 at night, the city council passed a resolution about inclusiveness, and I, I can't get on the internet, so I couldn't download my copy of it. But I thought that would be a good thing. It, it's it's a, a general resolution. It's in reaction to the election and the concerns that people have, but about ensuring that people feel safe and that their human rights are being recognized and that they're afforded due process and a whole lot of things like that. And I think it would be somehow if we could fit it in somewhere in the, under the community safety that this is a safe community for all persons um, with respect to how uh, the law treats them, treats people, and in other ways, and that it, it might be something to consider. Another thing that will be coming before the city, they may consider, uh, the new city council may consider is the concept of a sanctuary city. Again, we're talking about safety for, for all people. And this may be an appropriate place to refer to that, if, if not include that resolution. Um, 
And then I had a couple of just uh, grammatical uh, points. Oh, well, this one other question I have. The use in, in the natural environment section, we talk about a section that's called energy. In the safety, we call it power. And I don't know what the difference is and in what context and whether we should be consistent in, in the words that, that we're using. I know the power grid is different from um, energy supplies like from natural gas. So some, some clarification, uh, some little definitions to make a distinction there might be useful. That's a, that's a semantic issue. I'd love to raise semantics. And also, I want to thank you for the lovely food and the little gift. And thank you. Um, uh, so just to be fair, we will touch on everyone uh, to go, and we'll go down the line here. Um, why don't I start over there? Amy, you don't have a card up. Is there anything that you'd like to add to the discussion? OK, Adrian? Just really quickly, I think this is a really great section. Um, thanks, staff, for including some urban design issues around safety and, and the environment. Um, two points. So one on policy S3.11 about digital infrastructure and securing that. Um, it sounded a little bit like the city was trying to go it alone and discover what is right for us. Um, there, there may be some other cities we can learn from or other cities we can teach in terms of providing a safe digital and data infrastructure. And the last one is... Uh, on Annette's point about S2.9, preventing or prohibiting basements and flood zone. Um, that seems like a pretty specific policy. I, I, I mean, it, it, I, I'm just not sure this group really debated whether we're going to put that forward in the comp plan. I'm just raising it as it is now. Uh, otherwise, I think this is a great section, though. Thank you, Don. You've already spoken. El Elaine, Ellen, I mean. Well, I want to uh, uh, really thank the, uh, the staff for making the revisions of the, uh, with the organization of this, and I think it's fine. I have just one small comment, except it's a new addition. You have in S1 on community safety, you refer to the plans for the elderly and people with special needs, and I wonder if you want to include a another category, and that uh, are people who work or live on the third floor or above in high-rise buildings. Thank you. Alex? I was uh, also thinking about the point that Bonnie mentioned, and I was wondering if it wouldn't be worthwhile to change the vision statement. Uh, I don't know if that's in stone, but I noticed that the language would, sorry, would lend itself to that because the, the very first line of the vision statement is the city of Palo Alto is committed to the day-to-day -day safety of its entire residential business and visitor community. It would seem like we could include a line there that would accentuate that the risks or some of the hazards that we're concerned about are not just natural disasters or human disasters or toxic waste, but some of the things that I think have been a growing concern in uh, communities. So just a thought about where to put it. Thank you. Jennifer? Um, I think the element is shaping up really nicely. Also, most of my concerns were in the flood hazard and mitigation section. Um, I think it needs to be strengthened somewhat. Um, I didn't have time to write them up, though. But I have read this handout from Betty Jo Chang, and I would like to advance the recommendations that she puts there, in particular the first three out of the four. Um, other smaller issues are program S3.1.5, which is work with nonprofit organizations to provide information to the public regarding pesticides and other commonly used hazardous materials. I'd like to add insecticides to that list, pesticides, insecticides, and other commonly used hazards. That came up several times in the Natural Environment Subcommittee is a concern, so I would love to see that added here. Um, just above that, Program S3.1.3 about strengthening development review requirements has a second sentence that standards should be consistent with state and federal regulations. I think you can delete that second sentence because, of course, they have to be consistent with state and federal regulations. P 
page, the next page, or two pages later, program S3.6.2 about working with Caltrain and the U Palo Alto Unified School District to educate students on the dangers of rail trespass and benefits of suicide support. Mm -hmm. I'd like to add the public, educate students and the public, because it's not just students who are at risk. And that was all I had for this element. Thanks. Thank you. Doria. Um, I'll be quick. Thank you. I do think it looks much improved and very close to being ready. And just to be quick, I'll just associate my comments with Jen's and the committee and speakers before me. I do agree that the most important thing is probably strengthening the flood section. Thank you. Thank you. Hamilton, you've already spoken. May I come back to you? Uh, Whitney? Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think this section is looking great. I just uh, had a comment. There's uh, an identification of critical facilities, which has a, a triangle symbol, and it may be identified somewhere in another element, but it is, doesn't have a definition within this element at all, so I was having a hard time trying to understand what those represented. Um, and then I'm just uh, working with the engineers at Stanford just to make sure that the dam inundation map is correct um, from the records that we have, as well as the map uh, S9. Thank you. Jason. Yeah, I, I think it looks great. I've been, I was, each of the points that I was, was wanted to make sure were included, seem included, it's great. Okay, Lisa. I also think it looks great. I mean, it, it's a huge, I think, development to get here. I had a couple things um, similar to what Bonnie said. I think there, whether it's the vision that Alex mentioned or there's the human cause threats section is to add something about the inclusive and protecting everyone. The diversity is there, which is great to see. And I think wherever that policy or program goes, um, probably should also include something around the bullying or the, the, the children or teen issues that I think we've been seeing as well um, as part of the human caused threats. I think it belongs somewhere in safety, but I, I may have missed it. So is that, I, think I may we, just have missed it. So, oh, sorry, if I could. Um, that has been mentioned before, and I think it's in the community services okay. and facilities. I thought I'd it. seen something somewhere, but I, I yeah, might folks. along with something yeah. in safety as well, okay. given there is this human cause section in a sense, and that would, I think, pick up on what Alex and Bonnie said as well. Um, and then to go to a little bit on the flood hazards, which is the policy S2.8, because the programs now include existing, not just new development. I think the policy just needs to be slightly expanded so that, you know, it's something, minimize exposure to flood hazards by maintaining and enhancing existing flood and reviewing proposed development. Um, it's just because the programs have to do with, with existing as well. Um, and then this, this is one, a little bit what Adrian said on the basements. I'm not convinced we need to prohibit them. And the way it's written, I, this is more of a, a small technical thing. It happens that the neighborhood I live in is generally speaking in the flood hazard area or flood zone. Um, but our house is actually not in the flood zone. We have a map amendment, we're not in the flood zone. There are a few other houses there. The way it's written, I think it, we're not planning to build a basement, so it's not a, a personal issue. But I think the way it's written, since it's saying prevent the basements, in the neighborhoods within the flood hazard rather than that property within the flood hazard. I, it shouldn't be a neighborhood constraining a house that's not in the flood hazard if we keep this basement provision, which I would actually say I'm not sure we should. But if, if so, then fine. And beyond that, I just, I just want to echo, I think it's just been, oh, sorry, one other thing going to your point too. Um, there are several places that it mentions uh, elderly and people with disabilities and such. I, I'm wondering if, given the other discussion we had, we should also include children, um, just in general, because it tends to be, I, I mean, I think we naturally will protect children before anyone else, but it probably warrants having them in there because it is kind of a special need in a way. So that, that, but that's a consistent throughout, not a one particular section. And that was it, and I thought it was awesome. And thank you also for the lovely 
meal and gifts and the great year. <laughs> and I hear we may be seeing more of you. <laughs> yes, I'm not leaving, sorry. <laughs> Yay. Yay. All right, thank you. Uh, Bonnie, we've heard from you. Julia? Um, I don't have too much to say. The major concerns I had last meeting have been solved, so thank you. And clearly, the committee's done a huge amount of work. Thank you so much for all that. Thank you for the gifts. Um, and I would just concur with, with Alex and Bonnie and Lisa about adding um, something regarding the, the human safety element wherever everyone seems, deems it best fit. Thank you. Elaine? Yeah, thank you again. Great gifts, great meal, great everything. Um, I just, I'm glad that Alex pointed out the vision um, in the city of Palo Alto being committed to the day-to-day -day safety of its entire residential business and visitor community. Um, just looking through this um, in a cursory uh, exploration, it seems like um, while there was some language put in to sort of talk about and recognize the, the business community, I think there needs to be a few additional references to the business community. If you think about Palo Alto during the day, um, Monday through Friday, eight through six or whatever, I mean, the population almost doubles. And so that's a significant portion of the people. I think we need to explore the safety element through the lens of the number of people that it impacts and uh, which policies impact the most folks. So I think inclusion of business, especially under the emergency management section is critical. Um, uh, adding that to the, the seismic and the flood um, uh, hazard issues are, are the earthquake and geological hazards um, and flood hazard mitigation is important too. But I think what we would find by and large in, in the event of any one of these events um, during the business hours, we, we do need to have some attention to the, the volume of people who are in our city um, under that function and are not necessarily residents. Um, and similarly, I would just call out um, I appreciate Lisa and Adrian's mention of the um, the the um, suggestion to prohibit basements. I think you'll find that overall or across the city, the number of people who are affected by habitable basements is relatively small compared to the overall number of people who are in our city during the the, day, the business days um, too. So, um, and I also just in thinking ahead about implementation. Um, we've always been looking at these as paper documents. I think the average person is going to use this online. Um, we haven't talked much about cross-referencing, but you know the note, the idea of um, uh, you know making sure that everybody feels psychologically safe, and if that's in community services and facility, we need to recognize that within the safety element. I've also noticed, and just thinking about orders of magnitude and where safety occurs, I think. What you'd find is actually vehicular um, safety or um, vehicular incidents, traffic incidents, and safety through vehicular um, and pedestrian or vehicular and bike um, uh, incidents are probably going to be higher than, say, a, a really violent crime within the city of Palo Alto. So, um, I, you know, as we think about the the hyperlinks and coordinating between elements, I'd like to see some language. Where did I highlight this? Um, referencing. Okay, so Adrian mentioned S1.3.1, coordinating um, uh, or use of urban design principles. I'd also like to see streetscape design in coordination with Vision Zero, which was, I think, mentioned in the transportation element, because that's going to be probably the core effort that the city undertakes to really reduce any sort of um, uh, life, safety, health uh issue um, within the city. So just thinking ahead, we're, we haven't talked a lot about the uh, the intersections between elements, but hyperlinks in, in, in the, and if you look at San Jose or other um, general plans, they have all of these links to different programs and different elements. And I think we just need to, you know, make ours a little bit stronger by creating those links. Thank you. Steve. Any comments? Uh, and let us note that uh, Lydia has joined us, and I think you missed our thank you and um, grand send-off to your uh, uh, new position that you'll be uh, stepping into. Um, so we will miss you, but we suspect that you'll be uh, having a lot to do with our topics here um, in uh, the coming months. Anyway, comments about the safety element. Well, thank you, and I'm very sorry I missed it. Um, and thank you for all their food, and it smells lovely, and the presents. Um, 
as everybody said, the element is coming along really well. I um, noticed that the uh, introduction for the natural element, the preservation uh, word is put back in with the addition over here with the at places. That was one of the things I was going to mention. And then besides some random letters throughout the um, the uh, element itself, there's random letters, S's and R's that are by itself. Besides that, it looks fine. I did want to ask about um, in, um, let's see, policy N 1.1, program N. Lydia, um, we're actually on the safety element. Oh, you're on the safety. Yeah. Well, safety is great under Annette and Hamilton and Don's hands. <laughs> Thank okay. you. I'll go back later then. Thank right. you. <laughs> Uh, Hamilton, we missed you. If you want to speak again, and then we'll go to Arthur. Yeah, and these are just comments on your comments. And I wanted to start by following up on Bonnie's comment. I was a little shocked when they said it because we worked really hard to get the civil liberties and privacy in, and we did not limit it in scope to the residents. So I almost had a heart attack when she said it was almost limited to residents. And so I want to make very sure that staff and PlaceWorks changes the language in policy S16. We were focused on the program S12, which has the right wording. It says protect the public's privacy rights and civil liberty. And then either PlaceWorks or staff extracted it out for the policy. So on the policy S16, it needs to say public, not all residents, because we want to make sure our police department is looking out for everybody who's in the city boundaries. Um, so please make sure that's in there before it goes to um, city council. The, I just had a couple other comments. Um, you know, we want to continue to strengthen uh, basement groundwater at a level that's appropriate for the comp plan. I think some of the comments in here are a little bit too specific. I don't think we're putting implementation dates, for example, at this level. But I think that's important. I do think that Lisa's point about being in the flood zone, not the neighborhood, because all flooding is based on the flood designation of your property is really important. It, you shouldn't be penalized if you happen to be in a, prop, in a neighborhood with a lot of houses, but not within the actual flood zone. Um, so I think that was a really good point. And I agree with Elaine that the, the number one hazard in the city is actually vehicular. Uh, that yeah, should be covered in the transportation element. And I don't know what the right way to link it is. I think we want to avoid doing duplicate programs, but at the same time, make sure that it's referenced. Maybe it could even be referenced in the introduction um, as well. But absolutely, a vehicular safety as covered in the transportation element is absolutely critical. Um, and those are my comments. Thank you. Thank you, Arthur. Um, thank you. So the first thing I'll talk about is is the flooding issue. So if you look at um, S two point eleven point two, this is worded in a strange way. Work with regional, state, and federal agencies to determine if sea levels in the San Francisco San Francisco, San Francisco Bay warrant additional adaptation strategies to address uh, uh, flooding hazards to existing and new developments in infrastructure, et cetera? The answer is yes. You don't actually need to do anything to study that. And therefore, the issue is not to work with them to determine it, but work with them to determine what's needed. Um, so really, it should be work with regional blah, 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 blah agencies to develop adaptation strategies, to develop additional adaptation strategies to address flooding hazards, blah, 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 blah uh, with respect to sea level rise in the, in the San Francisco Bay. And I think that that's the way it should be worded. You know, it's a foregone conclusion, like our, our, our water, regional water treatment control, regional water quality control plant is going to be affected by sea level rise unless we do something. And so the question is not if, it's when and how um, and what we do about it. So this, this thing should be revised to actually do something. The second thing um, is with respect to habitable basements. Federal government FEMA regulations currently prohibit basements in flood zones, period. No ifs, ands, or buts. The question is, if somebody is just outside of a flood zone because they used a level of map amendment or, 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 or uh, uh, a, a LOMA or LOMAR, those are two things, 
um, then, then what happens with those things is if they're just outside the flood zone, then when you, if you build a basement, you're going to hit groundwater really quickly. And you're going to cause uh, a big problem. So the issue is, it's, it's, while it's not correct that it should be residential neighborhoods within the flood zone, because the, the neighborhood is either completely within or partly within or not within. So that, that wording is, 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 is awkward in terms of 2.9. Um, but, but it really gets into, in terms of program 2.9.2, uh, where we talk about the idea of groundwater levels 14 feet or less, or less. Now, what I'm wondering is 14 feet or less measured from what? And I'm assuming that that's 14 feet or less measured from ambient, from, from ambient ground level nearby, you know, whatever the, whatever the existing ground level is. And it doesn't actually say that. It doesn't actually say what 14 feet or less is from. So that's where we need to deal with it, because essentially, um, where you are an area that would be inundated by, uh, by flood zone, by flooding, including with sea level rise, that's an area in which we should not have basements. And this 14 feet is another way of measuring that. The idea of expanding the flood zone uh, restrictions to other kinds of building restrictions are actually much more problematic. So one restriction is the restriction on basements. And that's, I'm fine with the idea that you should not put new basements where, uh, you're, at a, where you're, you're at a current flood risk or, or incipient flood risk. Um, but if somebody is living outside the flood zone and their house burns down, um, and what happens is, uh, let's say they have a fire, but not all, the fu not all the house is burned, just they have a fire in their kitchen. And kitchens are expensive. And as a result of that, when you have to rebuild the kitchen, you then have to rebuild the whole house and jack up the house above the base flood elevation, uh, which is what FEMA regulations require in the flood zone. Requiring that outside the flood zone does not seem to make sense. And therefore, that regulation that requires jacking up the house when you rebuild it outside the flood zone, I wouldn't, I wouldn't that, that's too onerous restriction if, you're, if you have a kitchen fire, for example. Um, and so, so the issue is basements, expansive regulations on that, that makes sense. Expansive regulations of other FEMA regulations outside the flood zone doesn't make as much sense. And so we need to think about what you do there. Um, and so, for example, minor additions to square footage and having to have that above base flood elevation while the rest of the, uh, instead of the, the existing grade, uh, the level of the height of your house. You know, there are things like that, that subtleties for which I would not expand that in terms of this. However, on the other hand, if you scrape your house and build a new house, that should be above base flood elevation because it makes sense for that to be above the revised base flood elevation taking into account sea level rise. So I think that some nuance is appropriate here. Um, uh, finally, uh, the issue of S3.1.2 and hazardous materials. Um, this is written in two week away. Minimize the risks of biohazards in Palo Alto, including level four biohazards. No, bio, level four biohazards should be prohibited. No ifs, ands, or buts. Eliminating the other things, limit, minimizing the other things, yes. Level four biohazards, prohibiting, we should not allow introduction of them into our city. And so the wording of that is, is awkward and, 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 and incomplete. Similarly, the city has gone on record with removal of high levels of, of hazardous materials at the regional water quality control plant, in particular chlorine was removed. And uh, in terms of, um, of the CPI removing hazardous materials there, and so the city has gone on record, that policy of, elim of eliminating, re re prohibiting high levels of hazardous materials according to whatever the hazard requirements are, I'm not sure what the standards are for that, but that should be a policy under human-caused threats. And it's not there as far as I can tell, um, that, that, that the rule, and the city has gone on record of that, and so it should be captured in here somewhere. So those are the, those are the things that I'd, I'd like to bring up. And uh, I'd like to add my thanks to everybody for participating um, in this for the last year and a half and continuing, hopefully. And thanks to those of us uh, who are uh, not going to be continuing in their current capacity or, or at all because of, of, of uh, elevation to elected office. OK. Um. I see a couple of other cards up here. Annette, did you have something further to add? And then Jennifer, did you want to also? Okay. 
Well, this is really short. I'm not going to go back to the basements again, although I have some thoughts. Um, I agree with Elaine that we really should, in the document, have links. And there's not any that I could see in there. So um, I'm not sure everyone's going to be looking at it online, but that would be very useful. Um, but, so that's one. But my real comment is I'm very concerned or interested in the comments that Betty Jo um, Chang and Esther and Agenda made. And a couple of us have resonated to their comments. And although we didn't respond directly to them, I think they're all very, very good. I think Esther's more might fit in the um, natural environments section, the nexus of water and energy, which is really fascinating. We haven't talked about that. But um, the ones that Betty Jo mentioned, I think, are very, very reasonable. And so I would agree with Jennifer that we should include them um, in the comp plan, um, in, the, in the places that are indicated here. So that's it. So I don't know if anyone else wants to raise their card and resonate with that and also agree with me, or raise your hand if you agree with me. Staff, take that into consideration. All right, thank you. Uh, Jennifer. I don't want to overly belabor the basement flooding issue, but I do want to have some clarification because my understanding is that all flood zones are not created equal. There is more than one flood zone, and the FEMA requires requirement only prohibits basements within the FEMA special hazard, special flood hazard area. Um, as I also understand it, there are several parts of the city that the city deems pr prone to flooding that are not within that special flood, ha that singular special flood hazard zone. So I do think that it's worth providing for flood mitigation policies within the city government to protect the, house, the homes that are in those high flood prone areas. Um, I had another point. I forgot it. I'll have to come back if I remember. Thanks. Arthur. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll just elaborate on what Jennifer said. Uh, there are two main flood hazard zones in the city, the special flood hazard areas. Um, and one of those is from the uh, creek flooding from the San Francisco Creek, and the other is tidal flooding. And there are some houses and proper parcels that are actually subject to both flood zones. Um, and therefore have the, the whichever, they have the both restrictions applying essentially. Um, and those, those restrictions include no basements. They also, restrictions include when a new house is built, if it's, if it's a teardown, that the base flood, that the floor, the finished floor of the lowest level be above the base flood elevation. Um, and that if an improvement is, or rebuild is made, uh, exceeding 50% of the current value of the home, uh, then uh, that requires essentially jacking up the house over base flood elevation. Um, so if you add an addition to it or a model to it, you can generally do that within 50%. But if you have a, a, uh, a, a some sort of calamity like a kitchen fire, uh, which diminishes the value of the home, uh, then uh, when you go above, then, then the 50% the above that is actually fairly easy to reach and gets to problems, um, which is why I would want to put in a plug for the idea of ordinance or law coverage if you can get it on your insurance because uh, that will pay for bringing your house up to code, including jacking it up if necessary in the event of a rebuild if necessary in the event of a, of a covered uh, claim. My comment. Oh, Amy. Um, I um, I see that this uh, basement construction seems to generate a lot of interest, and so I um, I think that uh, we might wanted to put in um, a request for the study of 
you know, what is the appropriate um, policies that should be set for the basement construction, and especially that the land is very scarce in Palo Alto, and uh, in the interest of uh, uh, making sure that our land can be um, put into the best use. Um, I heard that that was like 14 feet. I, I'm not quite sure, did I hear it correctly? About, uh, I heard a number about 14 feet. Uh, Okay, um, so I, th you know, uh, with the technology is advancing, so it might be time that uh, the city do some study and to find out, you know, what would be the very best way so that we can conserve the water and regarding the, the dewatering of the basement excavation. Thank you. I just want to add one thing to the conversation. I am not uh, at all well informed on flood hazard issues, so I will not speak to that specifically. But uh, you know, Arthur's comments on the hazardous materials use raised for me this uh, issue that you know we're working on a general plan here, not a set of regulations. We have regulations uh, in our code specific to CPI and other other hazardous materials users, including uh, the biohazards. And so those things are already regulated by our code. <coughs> and our intention here in policy S3.1 and the programs that follow were to create a framework that supported those regulations and their perpetuation. So we didn't want to actually repeat the regulations. And I think the same can be said for the flood hazard issues. I think we want policies that support the community interests in minimizing flood hazards and precluding development that would accentuate or, or uh, expand those hazards. Uh, and that's sort of what we've been shooting for without getting to the point of uh, actually putting regulatory language in what is a general plan. I ho hope that helps. Thank you. Not that we need to talk more about basements, but <laughs> <laughs> I'm not actually going to talk uh, uh, about content. However, I will just simply mention that this isn't the only venue where basements are being discussed, and tomorrow evening uh, there's the Policy and Services Subcommittee meeting of the uh, uh, City Council where uh, Keith Bennett, the head of uh, Save Palo Alto's Groundwater, and I are making a presentation, uh, and Esther and others will be there. Uh, it's The scope is uh, very specific to uh, uh, the techniques of construction and the strategies relative to conserving our groundwater, um, where we are talking at the regulatory level as opposed to the comp plan level. But if you're interested, um, you can either come and join us uh, or you can read the minutes afterwards. And that may or may not then go to the council uh, later next year. OK, if there is no more conversation about that, uh, I would love to entertain a motion uh, to recommend uh, the uh, uh, the draft go to the council. Uh, I'm hearing that motion being made by Annette. Do I hear a second? Well, I, I'd like to make a friendly amendment. Please. Uh, just that um, staff has an opportunity to incorporate a couple of these uh, cleanup uh, provisions in there. And I'll yeah, second. I would actually support that. There were just some things that we just... <coughs> W missed. We wouldn't change policy where there are differences of opinion. We would continue with our practice of showing options. So we're not going to go in there and rewrite the policy from what you saw tonight. But people pointed out some wording things that we know we were intending to make, and they just somehow didn't get in there. But they will. So I, that, I agree completely that that's a good um, amendment. Arthur? Um, and as it is our practice of late, uh, anybody who has any additional comments that they wish to mm. go into the packet that goes to the council can do so until one week from today. Yes. And then that will go into the packet so that basically the, the council will get uh, the correct, let me refer to it as the corrected uh, ele safety element uh, to the, the minutes of today's meeting, the attachments and and uh, um, and uh, handouts at today's meeting as well as any additional notes submitted uh, by staff, by members of the CAC or members of the public to staff by a week from today. All right. Does the maker of the motion uh, accept the amendment offered by the seconder? Uh, all right. Then I think we can move forward with the motion as amended. All those in favor, raise their hand and say aye. Aye. 
uh, those abstaining or those not voting in favor? Those None. Opposed. And those, thank you, those opposed. Uh, and any abstentions? I think it is moved unanimously then by the members that are currently here. Let's move on to our next topic, the natural uh, environment chapter. Uh, does staff want to make some introductory comments? Yes, thank you, Dan. Um, and oh, before I forget, and also since it's kind of at the front of the element, I want to make sure you guys had a chance to see this uh, piece that was provided at places. This is from staff, and this is a revised first page of the element. I know Lydia already picked up on this. Um, there was a couple of changes to the vision and the introduction that were not captured in the um, version that you got. So I wanted to make sure you saw this. A few words, but they're important words, and these the vision and introduction components are important. So I want to make sure that you had an opportunity to take a look at that. So uh, just like we moved things out of safety, of course, we moved them into um, natural environment. So you probably noticed some changes in the overall organization of the element, primarily within the um, goal for water resources goal. And also uh, another change at the organizational level was to move goal three um, which is about creek, which is now goal three, um, about creeks and riparian corridors, to put that with the water resources goal. Lots um, of um, important synergy between these two goals in terms of things like storm water, water quality, et cetera. So those two goals are next to each other now, uh, and means that creeks and urban forests kind of switched places. So just to back up a step um, about the kind of history of this element since the last time you saw it, we did talk about this element on uh, November 15th when we were last together. And then since that time, we had another natural environment subcommittee meeting to go over the CAC's comments and kind of have one final review of this element. And we had... Um, a great discussion with the subcommittee and joined by a number of departmental experts from the urban forestry, public works, um, the city manager's office, uh, community services, and utilities um, to help us with this, with the refinements to the natural environment element. So we made the changes to the vision and introduction that I just um, pointed out. Uh, under the uh, urban space goal, We've continued to kind of make sure that we're really emphasizing this theme of connectivity and, and interconnectivity, and specifically by referencing the figure that we're pulling in from the Parks, Recreation, Trails, and Open Space Master Plan that has the natural systems map linking corridors and open spaces and urban parks um, into a really a kind of a, a whole, a holistic view of, of open space and habitat and ecology in Palo Alto. We are continuing to um, flesh out the language about review of special status species and the appropriate sources of, of what species could be considered. So we have a program to update the CEQA's the city's CEQA thresholds about special status species analysis. Um, we carried over an, our, an idea that's already in the urban forest section um, where the urban forester is involved in reviewing city projects to make sure that we do a similar type of review for projects that could impact open space. That's part of city practice already, but we wanted to acknowledge and memorialize that. And again, as, as Hillary was saying, kind of provide some basis for that um, as an ongoing practice. I wanted to point out in both this goal and the urban forest goal, there was some redundancy that we identified between the land use element and the open space, or excuse me, the natural resource element. The land use element uh, council draft that the council just reviewed um, had has a section on parkland acquisition. As you recall, when we were talking about the land use element, that was a very important topic that we spent quite a bit of time on. Um, and as we moved into the natural environment element and talked about open space, expansion, acquisition, et cetera, we noticed some overlap there. So we're proposing to consolidate those policies and programs about acquisition so that they're all in one place. I think as practitioners, we see that um, you've got a much greater chance of people noticing, understanding, and acting on those programs if they're all in one place rather than if they're kind of sprinkled throughout. And it gives us a chance to make sure that the document is internally consistent as well. Um, 
and I'll get to the similar kind of issue with urban forest in just a second. And then we did um, add a, a little bit more about the development criteria for the foothill area. This is a, a case in policy in point one nine, which you probably recall. A lot of detail since the time of the um, existing comp plan, a lot of detail has been incorporated into the zoning um, designation for the open space zone. But we, rather than kind of lose all that entirely and say, well, that's taken care of in the zoning now, we wanted to retain some of the most important features of those development requirements. And so we've added, we've rather than taking all of that out, we've gone back and put a little bit more back in there to make sure that it's really clear what the goals of those development criteria are. Um, moving on to urban forest, we've incorporated the changes from uh, canopy as we were discussed at our last meeting, and I think we've um, gotten those down at this point. We tried to be responsive to, to all of those requirements, or excuse me, requests um, from Canopy, and including uh, policies about avoiding net loss of tree canopy at the neighborhood level, um, and mentioning the urban forest in the vision and the, the introduction. Um, we talked at the subcommittee level about um, tree removal and the, a new program expanding the ability of community members to appeal tree removals. Urban forest is another place where there was some overlap with the land use section. The land use section actually has a whole um, subtopic on the urban forest. I think it's an important topic. And when we earlier on, when we talked about land use, we hadn't really gotten to urban forest yet. And we were all very anxious to talk about it and make sure it was in there. And I think now that we're looking at natural environment that has an entire goal about urban forest, we're seeing that that is a logical place for the policies and programs about the um, urban forest. So. We pointed out in your staff report and in the elements and places where those um, can be kind of consolidated and made sure that they are internally consistent again. Some of them were almost exact duplications. Well, three creeks and riparian corridors. I think one of the big things here to point out is that there are options in terms of the setbacks uh, for natural creeks, which are defined as those west of Foothill, uh, at, for either a 100-foot setback or a 150-foot setback. And your element um, includes a map of where that setback would apply. And those are two options that we anticipate would be carried forward to council. Uh, then in our goal four, water resources, uh, we had uh, public work staff present who helped to clarify the procedure for groundwater management in California. It's not really done by the city, it's done by a groundwater management agency, and in this case, it's the Santa Clara Valley Water District. So at our last meeting, we discussed adding some policy language that had to do with um, managing and planning for groundwater. That's really gonna be the role, the purview of the water district. So um, we changed that from making the programs and policies sound like the city was gonna be doing that planning to make sure that the city is gonna have a very strong, um, active kind of advocacy role with the district as they do their required planning um, and, and that the city is a very strong participant in that but not leading that effort. Uh, an idea kind of uh, that was added to these goals was uh, we had already policies and programs about minimizing impervious surfaces. At the subcommittee we talked about the idea that um, yes it's good that when Think something is going to be paved, it could be impervious or maximize impervious surfaces, but that the first step should be to try to minimize the area that is paved, even if it's going to be paved with impervious surfaces, and, and that site design uh, and new development should be kind of approached with that as a, as a goal, rather than just pave everything as long as it's impervious. So a little bit of refinement um, to that language. We did add a reference to insecticides, um, as Jennifer already mentioned. Um, and we also um, at, added some specific references to the city's recycled water ordinance. There is a recycled water ordinance in place that has a lot of detail about um, where and when and how much dual plumbing is required in, in new development for toilet and urinal flushing. So we didn't try to repeat all of the detail of that, but just refer to the, to the ordinance itself. Uh, under air quality, we just uh, expanded the program we had already put in about idling to include um, schools as additional source of uh, places where people idle and make sure that to the extent that issue is addressed or enforced that schools are included in those educational efforts. Uh, and there was a previous 
policy, there's an existing policy about mitigation of odor that had been, I think, in a previous version of the element formatted as a program that was corrected back to a policy consistent with what it is in your current comp plan. Uh, the noise element, uh, excuse me, noise goals ha hasn't changed too much. Um, one, one thing that was important to subcommittee members is um, changing a reference to uh, requiring certain types of review for projects that are subject to CEQA um, to clarify that that review should take place when the project is subject to the city's um, development review in response to concerns that um, which projects are subject to CEQA might change over time. And so this really puts that regulation kind of in the city's court rather than um, letting CEQA determine which projects do and don't get that level of analysis. Um, and we deleted the words large commercial from program N6.11.2 so that, uh, which references participating in regional forums to address noise impacts from airports so that it's not only large commercial airports but any airports. Goal seven uh, is about energy and again we were, we were joined by the city's uh, chief sustainability offers. Uh, Chief Sustainability Officer and also staff from the Utilities Department. So um, based on their feedback, we made some changes to several policies and programs on this in this section. Um, we did delete the program regarding the use of uh, carbon offsets or renewable energy credits, not because the city doesn't want to pursue that, but because that should be complete as of January. So that program um, is going to be already complete by the time this moves forward to council. So that's um, recommended for deletion. Uh, and then just some refinement of the language about um, implementation and incentives and prioritization in this section. I uh, also just wanted to mention that um, a change that's happened in this, under this goal had to do with transition from natural gas to electric. That was something that our subcommittee discussed in some detail. Natural gas use does have GHG emissions associated with it, and the SCAP um, takes a relatively aggressive approach towards phasing out the use of natural gas. Uh, in the comp plan, we're not quite as strong as some of the strategies that are in the SCAP, um, but we do uh, support the SCAP strategies of exploring that transition and continuing to figure out the best and also most cost-effective, feasible ways to move, phase out natural gas and move toward electrification. But the water has been, excuse me, the language has been softened somewhat. Finally, goal eight is about climate change and climate um, adaptation. And um, we've strengthened the wording of the policy instead of seeking to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in, in 8.2, we are just gonna reduce greenhouse gas emissions. We're not gonna seek to do it, we're just gonna go ahead and do it. Um, consistent with the council's action in approving uh, the, the SCAP policy framework um, since the time that we met on this, on this element in November. Um, we also reworded the program about protecting the Municipal Services Center and other facilities from the impacts of sea level rise, including the wastewater treatment plant. Um, we refined the wording of the policy that in 8.4 that wants to balance um, responses to sea level rise with protecting the natural environment, so we don't respond to sea level rise by building a bunch of new infrastructure that's gonna damage the delicate bayfront uh, ecology. And then um, finally, I just wanted to note that at the subcommittee level, we did discuss the idea of a policy that would have um, prohibited the city from obtaining power or electricity from a specific type of solar energy called a concentrated solar thermal. Um, this was due to concerns at the subcommittee level about potential impacts on birds in particular. Um, and the utility staff has said that this is not um, part of the power portfolio right now. It wouldn't be a major constraint right now, but um, just being able to be flexible and responsive as technology changes and as costs of electricity change in the future, um, they felt uncomfortable about adding a specific prohibition on a specific type of alternative energy project. So that um, policy is not in the version that you have before you tonight. And that's it, I think. Thank you. Uh, are there members of the subcommittee that would like to speak to this? If so, please turn your cards up. Don, Jennifer, Doria, let's go in that order. Don, you're first. So I think I have a mishmash of comments. 
uh, complementary and disagreement and detail in general. Um, first off, I think that uh, once again, the organization is the changes in organization are important because they they create interesting structure, um, and and they do a better job of sending the message across. Um, I do want to compliment uh, the staff. Uh, our staff, if I can, <laughs> if I can refer to them that way, uh, for participating. But I think also the fact that they got so many other staff from other departments to come and participate in those meetings needs to be complimented. And I know that wasn't easy to do, and 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 appreciate their time. Um, under the vision uh, statement, right from the start, I like the fact that we're no longer saying that this natural environment is all about uh, uh, beauty and and. Uh, and appearance, and we've added health, and I think that that's uh, I think that that's really important. Um, in the vision statement, I, I do wonder why we say even in built-up areas, as opposed to just simply say in built-up areas or whatever. I, I I'm not quite sure that even doesn't doesn't detract from what we're trying to say. Um, in in terms of details, I think that. Uh, um, people should be complimented for adding so much of the stuff about insecticides, impervious surfaces, idling, and I think the challenge will be whether we have the will and the ability to enforce uh, enforce those things. I think Shawnee, uh, who's not here, should be complimented on her contributions to that. Um, I like the idea that in general we're talking about preservation and, and not management. I think that that's a really important concept. I think when this was written 20 years ago, management was probably the issue. I think preservation is today. I think that I'm not sure we're strong enough with the public appeal uh, process or ability relative to tree removal. I think that we might want to uh, uh, strengthen that. Um, I really like the fact that we've added the concept of smart energy grid, uh, but I think there's more opportunity for smartness um, in, the, uh, in the whole natural environment and data collection we do. Um, I, I think over the next 15 years, the length of this plan, the transition from natural gas probably will be a, a higher, um, of higher importance than, than it appears today. And, and the fact that we're dealing with carbon offsets, um, I would object that we're removing that from here. Uh, the idea that there should be carbon offsets as opposed to just to simply eliminating the problem and not... Uh, uh, and, and not having offsets. The same thing with uh, solar thermal. Uh, I, I worry that we're removing that because uh, we're worried about the economy of this, and I'm not sure in our natural environment section we should be worrying about the economy as opposed to the environment. Uh, solar thermal is well known to be uh, um, hazardous. Um, as, as was mentioned, I really like the idea that we're being positive. We're not seeking to reduce greenhouse gas. We're going to reduce it. Um, and in the um, uh, map N3, I do want to mention that the fact that that map shows regional habitat connection, I think the connectivity of our habitat is really, really important. And I think that that fact that that got called out, I'd like to thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you, Don. Jennifer, and then Doria. Yeah, I think this element is coming along, has come along great. I really appreciate staff and PlaceWorks work on this. They really transformed a lot in terms of how it's presented and how the content comes across. Um, I just have a few comments. Um, program N1.10.2 about dedicating publicly owned recreation, open space, and conservation areas as parkland. I'd like to, that to say publicly controlled and not publicly owned. We currently have quite a bit of parkland, dedicated parkland that is under long-term leases. We don't own it as a city, but we've nonetheless dedicated as parkland to preserve that function for the life of the lease. So I'd like this, that to be changed to controlled. Um, and same program <coughs> offers examples of things that we ought to consider dedicating as Renzel Wetlands and Gamble House. I believe the Renzel Wetlands is dedicated parkland already. Um, so a different example would be good there. Um, the Rinconada Community Gardens would be one that's not dedicated parkland, but is clearly a park-like use. Um, policy N2.2 under the urban forest. 
that's where I think you consolidated the land use policy about urban forest as infrastructure into this natural element policy. I actually think the urban forest, I think we ought to retain that original land use policy L point L9.11 in the land use section as well. Um, more than parks and preserves and other open space, the urban forest infrastructure is really impacted by all developments and all land use decisions. So I think it has a broader concern and ought to be elevated in both elements. Um, next comment. Oh, the groundwater regulation. I understand that the water district has regulatory authority over that. Um, I know we previously had a program that pr pr called for looking into setting fees, use fees for groundwater extraction. Um, I assume that that came out because we don't have the authority to do that. Is that correct? If it's not correct, I think we should put it back in. <laughs> if it is correct, then I think we ought to be really cautious about, um, we ought to be looking for other ways to control the groundwater impacts of excavation. Jennifer? We, yeah. Sorry, there, I don't know if this is what you're thinking of, but under in 4.7.1, there is still a bullet point that says an approach to metering extracted groundwater. Is yeah, that, was that, I don't know if metering means charging a fee or if it just means monitoring how much is extracted. So I think where it was before was in program N 4.8.2 and that program needs some editing anyway. It doesn't, it's not a, a sentence. <laughs> so I'd love to see fees back in there if it's allowable. If, not, I get that, um, but we ought to be looking for other ways that the city can reduce dewatering beyond regulation of the dewatering. And one of those ways is to control underground construction. Um, next, and this is my last comment, I think, is also about water. Um, program N 4.13.1 is about standard, a standardized process for evaluating the impacts of development on the storm drain system, including point source discharge, base flow, peak flow, et cetera. I would like to add to that something about exploring opportunities for cost recovery based, increased cost recovery based on those evaluations. Um, it doesn't really get us very far to just evaluate the impacts if we don't have a strategy for doing something about it. So I would like to add a cost recovery element to that program. That's all I had. I'm having trouble finding that number. See, it, it's, it's N413. It's page oh. N33, okay. N4.13.1. Thank you. I just Sorry. missed. You said 1.3. Oh, I was. My bad. Right. No, no, that's number. fine. We just want to make sure we have it. That's all. <laughs> Thank you. Um. I also wanted to thank staff for including so such a broad range of experts from other departments. That was very helpful, especially given the very technical nature of the energy section. And in general, I had a concern that the energy section, as Director Ginnelman say, saying, would be overly regulatory instead of general enough. And I think there's a couple things where it does lean lean a little that direction because I think there's likely to be so many new technologies and changes in the years to come. So as, if anything seems too regulatory versus broad, I think it could be made more general. But I do think, based on what I learned at the subcommittee meetings, I would be more comfortable if uh, concentrated solar power was called out. It wasn't just for birds. It was for a lot of, um, a lot of other species, and it, it has a lot of negative, really profoundly negative effects. That's not to say if 20 years from now it was the only way we could get energy, we wouldn't be able to rethink it. But I think it belongs in there as a, at least as a cautionary thing, if not outright prohibited. Um, wait, I have to put on my glasses. Oh, I agree with Jen about 1.10.2, um, and that's about pursued dedication of, and her 
change compu publicly controlled. But I would like to get rid, rid of the word pursue and just say dedicate. That just needs to get done. And I also agree with her um, comments on the urban forest. And then finally, in the groundwater policy we were just talking about, I had a concern about um, gr um, contaminated groundwater from sites migrating that you guys addressed in the safety uh, elements, so thank you very much. But I wonder if there shouldn't be a correlating um, bullet under 4.7.1 that sort of strengthens the idea that it should be, a, that those things need to be looked at and addressed. Because what we find is that there's assumptions of where the plume goes and where it doesn't go, and there's recently been some testing in certain neighborhoods, and I would just think it would be good for it to be tested, and once and for all, that could, or it could be, it should be tested regularly, but on a reasonable basis. But I think there needs to be a bullet there to address that. Thanks. Okay, why don't we go around the table? Um, Lydia, would you start us off? Mine is um, pretty short. Um, <clears throat> Policy N1.1 uh, under program, in the programs. So I was wondering, uh, program N11.2, promote and support ecosystems protection and environment education programs in Palo Alto. Since a lot of our ecosystem touches the other, there are other cities that it touches, I was wondering if we should have another program um, to include adjoining cities such as East Palo Alto or um, Woodside, et cetera, the cities that adjoin and then um, on page N17, um, in one of the bullets it says, and I don't understand this, it says be clustered or closely grouped in relation to the area surrounding to reduce conspicuousness, minimize access roads. I um, wonder if the ness, that word, is there too much additional wording in there? But I didn't, page N17. Okay, and then it starts again. So those are just a couple of the things. And then also, like I said earlier, the random letters in different areas. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Elaine. A couple of um, kind of specific wording comments. Um, policy uh, N 1.1, um, I think there's so, sometimes there's this, a, a tendency to suggest that everything that's landscaped is, is natural. And I, I, I just want to um, make a suggestion for the second sentence of that policy, respect the role that natural and constructed landscapes play within the urbanized part of the city, because not everything that is green is actually natural. Every lawn or grass lawn that we put out there is, is actually not native landscape necessarily. Um, on the, oh my gosh, there's a couple, a lot of little things. Um, uh, I'm glad to see uh, urban forest and understory as a category right before goal N2, but I'm wondering if we can also include the word understory as part of um, goal N, the language in goal N2, so a thriving urban forest and understory. Um, the understory, um, uh, I think that while the urban forest is primary and, and the trees um, really provide the, the bulk of the ecosystem benefits um, for both the um, the open space and the uh, the urban areas, I think the understory plays a strong role, especially in things like stormwater management and drainage. Um, so I'd like to see the understory also um, put back in, uh, especially like under policy N2.2, recognize the importance of the urban forest and understory. Um, and then I think there's also some language that I, I find a little bit um, loose, uh, the appreciation of natural systems. I think maybe something that could be stronger and is actually a, a, a concept, um, a strong scientific concept is the, the, the term ecosystem services. And so maybe instead of appreciation of natural systems, we can kind of make that stronger um, and really recognize the actual services that um, uh, natural landscapes and, and connected ecosystems provide for our city. Um, let's see, creeks and riparian areas, uh, goal N3, um, again, just a few, there's, I, I've, I've, I've pushed in the past for separating um, the natural creeks from the channelized creeks, and I think that the language here is still kind of conflating those things, so 
Um, I'm not sure that we would necessarily want to push for conservation of all the channelized creeks. Um, if there's room to make improvements to the channelized creeks in future, I'd like to see the language, uh, per, you know, be open to that. So I might suggest conservation of natural um, creeks and riparian areas as open space amenities, um, ecological habitats, and elements of community design, and then also make separate uh, the mention of maintaining um, channelized creeks so that, uh, because I think that they're very different, they're highly, the channelized creeks are highly constructed and very different and don't provide the same services as the natural creeks. Um, and then in, I think the there's a mention of map N4 um, illustrating where the possible 150 foot setbacks are, and that's just not very clear in the in the draft that was sent out. Maybe that it shows up better in the big map, but it's not very clear uh, from the from the small. Um, and I also just am not, and maybe this is something that staff can provide later. But um, I'd like to understand where the the suggestion for 150 feet setbacks come from. Like if there is a strong, if there's strong evidence or a recommendation from you know, uh, another agency or best practice, because it's not clear to me why 150 feet as opposed to 100 or 125. Um, and then, oh, and then, sorry, just one more thing on climate change. I think there's a reference to the sustainable community strategy, um, which I think is a, is a mandate from SB 375. Um, and I, I mean, the core of the sustainable community strategy is really to integrate land use, transportation, and housing. And program N8.1.1 makes uh, reference to a whole bunch of other things that it's important for, climate change, greenhouse gas, water, water supply, sea level rise. But really, the crux of you know, the mandate for sustainable community strategy is to integrate land use, transportation, housing for those climate change and greenhouse gas reductions. And so if there's a way to kind of reference that and, again, tie this piece, this natural um, uh, environment element back to land use, back to transportation, and, and further those links. I'd like to see that happen. Thank you. Julia. Um, so I just have one little comment. Um, thank you, subcommittee, and thank you for meeting with all those experts. This is clearly very detailed section, and I appreciate the work you guys have done. Um, program N293, I think there was... Um, someone who who mentioned this last meeting, um, I'm just concerned. Um, expanded opportunities for community members to appeal the removal of trees um, in private residences. It, I don't know. I maybe it's okay. It it makes me a little uncomfortable. Um, but something to consider that that there was someone last meeting, and I also concur that. Um, I, I'm not sure about that language. Um, did staff understand that? I wasn't. Uh, is your point? Forgive me for asking. Um, my point is that so it's expand the opportunities for community members to appeal the removal of trees under the under um, private residences, and I I'm not sure that. Community members is that should is increasing desired. what's what's already there is okay. there. Thank you. Uh, and forgive me, anything else? No. Okay, Bonnie. Thank you. I think uh, the uh, element has really been put together very nicely. Most of my comments are for the purpose of uh, clarification. Even though this is not a regulatory document, I want to make sure that it's what you mean to say is really well understood. So like in N1.1, you talk about managing private open space, and I'm not really sure what private open space is. There are other references to residential backyards, and that's private open space, and it's nice to, in, you know, tell residents about nice ways to keep your backyards, and there's nothing very... Um, regulatory about what is said, but I'm not sure what is meant by private open space. Do you, do you mean all the land that people have there that are, is in the open space zones that's private or what? So I just, a little definitional um, clarific, little paraphrase or something that would add to that. Um, you mentioned that you put in a lot of the, in the bullet points under N, 1.9, which is a lot of the um, development requirements in the open space zone. Maybe you should just say that that is comes from the zoning code 
for for uh, the development standards for uh, building in the open space zones in that, that section. Um, policies, I think it's N.11, where it talks about working with Stanford, Santa Clara County, and, and, and the Water District. I would add San Mateo County, because so much of Stanford is also in San Mateo County. We might as well, they're right across San Francisco Creek. We should be working with them in those. In the um, urban forest area, I have no problem with the intent, but I think there's, uh, it isn't clear what a street tree is. I know, or I understand a street tree to be those trees that the city planted in the, in the city rights of ways. And it, that isn't defined well here. So that policy N2.7 that says require new commercial multi-unit, blah, 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 to provide street trees, it's so vague, like where? When? What, what do they need to provide? Uh, I, I have in my uh, comments submitted um, alternate language that would specify that if you remove a tree or if there are no trees in the right of way in front of the property that you're developing, then you, you do something about it. But i just asking uh, for more explicit language in that area. Um, the creeks, I just have one question. The one of the, in the setback requirements, it says ensure that uh, if you're going to have a trail along a creek that's only on one side, and I'm thinking of Fern Canyon in, in Foothills Park, there's a beautiful trail that goes up one side of the creek, crosses over and goes down the other side. So you want to you be sure that, it, that there are um, some trails that it, it may be appropriate to have it on both sides of a creek. Or maybe if it's high up, it doesn't matter. Um, uh, water resources I uh, suggest in my written comments mostly uh, grammatical changes for for clarification and also under air quality in the noise section uh, policy n6.1 you have a whole huge long thing about um, decibel levels and it it doesn't belong here. I mean, it, you, you said earlier you want to keep this on a high level and not be regulatory. So that whole section, it goes for about a whole page. I can't find Oh, here it is, on page N35. If you can just refer to um, these the guidelines for maximum outdoor noise levels and interior noise to some document and not repeat it here in the comp plan, it would be more consistent with the, um, the broad uh, scope that we're trying to do. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Hillary. Just one note on that last comment. This is a crazy section where the state uh, guidelines actually require some excessive detail on interior and exterior noise levels. So we'll look at it. If there's a way to simplify it, we will. If you got to do it, you got to do it. <laughs> if you got to go. <clears throat> Lisa. I actually have nothing to add. I thought that the new programs, the new policies were awesome. And I love especially the extra protection for our trees and the urban canopy. And, but I didn't see anything major, and, and some of the others have been mentioned. So, Thank you. Jason. Um, yeah, I, I generally was re really impressed. And actually, was really proud to be at Palo Alto and just reading through this and seeing this, the stuff that we're, we're uh, promoting and, and planning for. Um, there were a couple things. Uh, one uh, on the non-concentrating so solar thermal. Um, I didn't know if there was a particular reason why we didn't say that we wanted to do solar water heating. I mean, there are, there's you know in Israel and Hawaii, other places, it's actually mandated. Every new home has to do it. If we want to reduce natural gas usage in a place that's sunny the vast majority of the time, it seems like we should probably at least encourage it, and potentially even just say new construction should incorporate solar water heating of some sort. Um, and then also on water usage, um, there was, we had something in 4.16.3 saying that we wanted to investigate ways to use non-traditional water sources, and it, uh, including things like gray water and such, but it seemed kind of wimpy for something that's supposed to be looking way, way out, you know, 20 years in the future. It, lots of places use gray water now, so why, why wouldn't we say we want to encourage the usage of gray water and say this, this is, there's a lot of water that's going to waste that could use, be used for irrigation and houses and 
all that right now. So just want to be stronger there. Great. Thank you. Whitney. Thank you. Um, I just want to, I have two comments. One is on map uh, N-1. Um, I believe that the map has been um, created from the bike and pedestrian uh, plan that was adopted uh, earlier, I think in 2012. Um, and so built upon that are these pollinator pathways that do seem to be getting some traction. And as a concept, um, I think it's an interesting and supportable concept. But I would just want it to be, uh, just to identify that the, the lines that are drawn on the map look as though they follow a very specific course. Um, and it may, it should just be a conceptual diagram because the lines do go through existing um, property. They don't really follow the right of way. They go through um, parking lots and buildings. I know in particular through the research park they do. So it doesn't really follow an, what would one would think of as a natural um, pathway where you would have landscaping. So I just wanted to identify if the idea the idea is conceptual. The map should sort of reflect that point. If it's not, then really where they're drawn should be uh, looked at a little more. And then um, program N2.12.3. This one is, um, I think it's a little overreaching. It's about cooperating with different entities, including Stanford and Caltrain and PG&E and um, what not to ensure that tree planting removal and maintenance practice are consistent with city guidelines. So it's, uh, uh, throughout the document, I really wanna make clear if it's, if it's meant to be applying to Stanford University, we'll talk about that. If it's meant to apply to Stanford, the lands that Stanford owns that are within the research park that are, um, then I think that just, that, that distinction needs to be made. Um, those Stanford-owned lands uh, that are within the research park already have to meet city regulations. But if it's really intended to be Stanford University as it's written, Stanford already has to comply with county regulations. And there's regulations for landscaping and tree removal and replacement. And also Stanford has the ability to um, do a vegetation management plan where they holistically look at the whole of the campus to look at the trees and the landscaped areas for all of the lands within Santa Clara County that is different and more comprehensive than just an identified parcel um, and the tree that's on that one sort of regulated parcel where they're doing a building. <laughs> so it's a way to that one might be preserving more trees in the long run if you're looking at it comprehensively. Um, and so I, I just think if the way that it's written is um, uh, sort of not appropriate, it's overreaching, and Stanford has to comply with other guidelines that might be more can apply. What, what number it's is that again? N2.12.3. So it may be that you know we the language ensure and consistent with city guidelines that that needs to be softened in some way. Thank you. Sorry, Annette. Don't we wish we had a plan like that in Palo Alto? Um, I basically agree with some of the comments, most of the comments that Doria and Jen made. Um, a couple of comments on policy N14, program 4.1. It calls for review of CEQA thresholds of significance regarding special status species, but it leaves it sort of hanging. So it's fine to call for a review, but what is the action on that? maybe report status to the agencies listed. Um, the one goal that I'd like to see added that I've asked three times already is I would like something, probably a new program, N212, to explore the feasibility and locations for a memorial park to commemorate citizens who have contributed significant public service to the city of Palo Alto. I've talked to Canopy about that. It's sort of an ongoing thing, and I think it would be nice to be in the comp plan. Um, 
program N341 addresses creek stewardship, and this is sort of currently ongoing with Actera. Um, and so I think we need to address that. At least I get an email like every day uh, referring to this. So maybe the word develop, uh, replace the word develop to enhance or expand would be worthwhile. Um, Annette, I'm sorry. What, what, can you state which when you were looking at there? Okay. I, I sent you actually some of the notes. But oh, okay. N program N3.4.1 addresses creek stewardship. And Actera seems to have a lot going on in that, so you should at least address that. Um, another thing is I would like um, a little further on to under policy N4.1. 15 to add a new program. Um, I think Dory or Jen referred to this, and certainly the storm, uh, the Palo Alto, uh, say Palo Alto groundwater have talked about this. Um, something to the effect of consider prohibiting water from new construction for basements to flow into storm drains. So consider um, prohibiting water from dewatering to go into storm drains. And they'll talk about that tomorrow night. Um, and then sort of a funny one on this program, N522, I think it either needs to be omitted or rewording. I understand the philosophy of addressing cars idling for more than three to five minutes, and I can certainly see that in a driveway. But, you know, with our traffic jams, that certainly is a possibility on city streets. And so we need to um, sort of, we can't, really regulate cars getting stalled in traffic for huge amounts of time. And finally, the only other thing I'd like to um, mention at this time is what Bonnie was talking about, city trees and the right-of-way. I think the city needs to do a lot of work about in, in this area. Um, I think that street trees should be mandatory. They're not. They're, it's sort of voluntary, and if someone right now dumps a tree, you know, takes it down, which they do all the time, whether it's in the front of their property or a city-owned tree, there's no code enforcement or regulation for them to put it back. And a lot of um, planting trees, even in city right-of-way areas, is controlled by what I consider very fickle uh, rules in that you have to plant at a certain distance from driveways and utility out boxes which if you planted the right species of trees, that wouldn't be a consideration. So um, I agree that with Bonnie that there needs to be some work there, but we also need to really look at zoning and what we can do in that area. I have some more, I have some more comments, but it's sort of in the notes that I sent this. Um, okay, we can come back to you if you like later, the next yeah. one. Uh, Hamilton. I wanted to commend the subcommittee on a very thorough and thoughtful modernization of the element. Um, it's really looks in good shape. I just want to go through quickly. I've been focused on the safety element, but I want to make a couple of comments on people's comments tonight. Uh, Don's comments really resonated with me, as did Annette's. I want to second Elaine's mention of distinguishing channelized creeks. You know, that ship has sailed, and I understand some people are not happy, but they were channelized for very good reason. And we they are very different than something like the San Francisco Creek, which has not been channelized. And it's important to distinguish between them. In terms of Julia's comment about um, not expanding appeal of removal of trees, um, it wasn't meant to go so far as to allow neighbors to prevent you from moving them, but merely to notify. So I think within that context, it is appropriate to expand so at least you can be notified that your neighbor's about to um, remove a tree. I really agreed with Bonnie's comments about the need to clarify what private open space means. Is it your backyard or is it like space within the private open space? We need a clear definition of that along with what a street tree is within the element. Um, I want to second Jason's uh, recommendation on encouraging gray water. And I just want to go into reinforce a couple of things that Annette said, including the Memorial Public Park. Um, we really need to prohibit dewatering into storm drains. I absolutely agree with that. And um, 
the street trees, we really need code enforcement to replace them. I had a neighbor across the street, who I like a lot, by the way, um, but they, 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 they removed their tree. And, uh, you know, I don't know if it's ever going to be replaced, but I mean, it's like a very key location. And so I think it is imp important that we have um, mandatory street trees and that they be enforced. It's really part of the character of, and part of the preservation of our urban forests. So I'd love to see at least a little bit of strengthening of language in that. So again, I want to thank the subcommittee for a great job. Thank you. Doria, we've uh, heard from you and Jennifer uh, Alex. <clears throat> yeah, my comments, I appreciate the extensive nature of this element. I just had a couple comments on the urban forest uh, section and understory. I was struck by, it seems that there's a, an emphasis within the goal and to particularly to uh, protect the urban forest from development. That comes up numerous times, which seems appropriate in ways. But I guess the other thing we've talked about before that there's a either the imminent threat of drought and uh, flooding, you know, one or the other, the feast and the famine and the water. And I realize you have N2.6.2, which is a mention of drought, but it seems to me that there, there's something missing in terms of a plan or who's thinking about what happens to the trees uh, if drought continues or if, as the other charts show, flooding continues and what's the impact I don't know if that'd be true in other areas as well, but it seemed like there'd almost be another section or under protection and expansion, some greater mention of drought and uh, flooding with regards to the trees since that's a, a significant portion of the city. Um, the other thing I thought about was in uh, program N6.2.1 under noise. And I, I was just, uh, it says continue working to reduce noise impacts created by events and activities taking place in communities adjoining Palo Alto. And I couldn't think of anything other than a Stanford football game or Shoreline. No, I, I was getting there. Those are the old, wow, you people are on top of it, man. Couldn't even get to number two. So, um, but the thing is, I, I've lived here 15 years and I, I've noticed no change. So the word continue has no meaning for me there. So I, I wonder if there's a way to toughen that up. Maybe it's happened, but I've heard nothing about um, sometimes you'll hear nothing and then you'll hear it like it's crystal clear, especially in South uh, Palo Alto. And so I wonder if there's a way to toughen that up so that can we actually make some changes? Because it, it's not my understanding that Mountain View's done anything to change Shoreline, to erect a wall in the back, um, you know, as some other theaters have done. But uh, it's my, my, my feeling is nothing has changed. So uh, that, that program feels destined for uh, not working unless it's beefed up. Thank you. Ellen? Sorry. Well, I am quite in awe of the uh, knowledge and the uh, ability of the subcommittee and the committees. What I really want to know is what is the distribution of this uh, plan when it's published and is approved by the council who do you expect to read it and use it and have it as a reference? Could you answer that for me, please? Only the extremely. Uh, this is envisioned as a plan that will be used by the city decision makers, uh, staff, and the public in reviewing development applications, uh, legislative changes, uh, capital investments. So it's intended to be a broad policy framework that will be available to inform those decisions and allow uh, everyone to balance um, our goals and um, priorities. I can just add, uh, I would use it professionally at least a couple times a week. Anything else? Done? Done, everyone. Oh, uh, no, I said done, not Don. <laughs> Adrian, go ahead. All right, uh, overall, I really agree with a lot of folks here. This is a pretty good document. Um, three points, also want to echo the gray water thing. It does seem conspicuous now that you guys both mention it. Um, policy N5.2 about supporting behavior changes to reduce emissions of particulates from automobiles. Um, that's a really big goal. I think everyone would agree with it. There's not much meat underneath it. 
Uh, it relates pretty heavily to our transportation element. It might be related to incentives for EVs. Um, it just seemed pretty thin for such a large policy. The, the last thing I was wondering about, um, just a suggestion, there's a lot of new uh, finance mechanisms for clean energy, clean water, cleaner utilities, uh, so that residents can do it locally, even like you know solar share programs. Um, there may be something here in terms of the city promoting or identifying uh, or working with residents on new clean power and clean water uh, initiatives. Thank you, Amy. Um, so I, um, I think this is an amazing uh, element that I, I first thought it was pretty boring, and then after I read through it, I admit I'm just like totally wrong. Um, but I wanted to focus on this energy use because um, we all know that um, about 40% of our energy consumption is really in the residential buildings. And um, so I was looking at this energy use, particularly in policy in 7.7. And it says, um, explore a variety of cost-effective ways to reduce natural gas to um, in the existing and new buildings in Palo Alto. Um, and so I think that since it talks about the existing buildings, we have a lot of uh, um, homeowners that they are now interested in remodeling instead of selling their houses. So this might be an area that we can really, really capitalize on, you know, on harvest some of the uh, energy and reduce the energy use. So maybe in the programs that uh, we could have something, you know, like in provide incentives for the existing homeowners that are wanting to upgrade their uh, energy use. Um, so, for example, um, the program 771 talks about the carbon neutral and natural gas supply. Something, I think, uh, something that, that we all talked about, the incentives so that might be, uh, that might be something uh, we can consider. The other one is that the policy N76. It has a very specific language in talking about um, solar uh, photovoltaic panels. This is this is like a, a particular a clean energy that we wanted to promote. But for example, uh, Elon Musk is just uh, talking about incorporating the solar panel into a roof tiles. So. As we advance in technology, and uh, um, Hillary, you talked about this. You know, um, this a complaint is really to be high level and for the broad, the language. So maybe this, you know, specific reference to this kind of the uh, solar panel might be just too spe specific. Um, instead, um, maybe you wanted to talk about the clean energy or solar energy or something really high level. And I have a question about in uh, program N763 says it promotes solar energy in individual private projects. And I'm not quite sure what does that mean. Individual private projects, does that mean um, new buildings? Single family homes, uh, or or um, garage, or, or what? Or, um, just like not very clear on that. Amy, what so anyway, number was that again? I'm sorry. Program seven six three. Um, page fifty four. She's looking at the track change version. Maybe you're looking at the clean one. Okay, yeah, so um, anyway, I just thought that this energy section, uh, when it touches upon the um, existing homes, that part is the area we can focus on. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Arthur? Um, so I've been listening to this, and I and, uh, have a few comments, some of which are on comments other people have made. So firstly, 
Um, I wholeheartedly agree with uh, Don McDougall about the need to improve the tree removal uh, appeal process. Currently, um, if a private owner wants to remove a tree, they do appeal, they basically apply for it, and then the city approves it or denies it, and the neighbors who may be affected by that removal because of enjoyment, you know, the tree, all people nearby see the tree, enjoy the tree, they have no rights currently at all. Maybe they get notified, but you can't do a damn thing about it. And therefore, a strengthening that to allow an appeal, particularly for protected trees, but even for non-protected trees, wherever, there, wherever there's an appeal process that, that is in, for an application, if there's an application, the neighbor should be able to appeal. The city decides, just like any other development going on. With respect to um, N2, that, 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 by the way, that's with respect to two, N2.9.3. With respect to 2.12.3, I think that this should be referred to within the city of Palo Alto. Um, I agree with the idea of Stanford University with uh, lands within the city of Palo Alto. Um, I don't think it should be weakened at all, and I believe it should explicitly include the city of Palo Alto utilities because our utilities have been butchering trees not consistent with city guidelines. Uh, I agree entirely uh, with uh, the comments of Elaine Wang with respect to channelized versus natural creeks. The ship has sailed. We are not going to remove channelized creeks, the channels there. If anything, there are po potential for raising the heights of the channels in order to have sea level rise dealt with. Uh, so they ain't going away and don't expect them to go away and build, re uh, create regulations that are consistent with them staying. Um, the, uh, the issue with respect to extracting uh, groundwater, um, the water district does have regulations in terms of, of extracting groundwater, or basically in terms of wells. But other than that, they have no regulations with respect to that. So expecting that to be reliant on, this, on the water district's regulations means that there are no regulations. Uh, regulating pumping into storm drains is something that's reserved to the city. The water district has no say on that. Um, and so that's something in which it does make sense for us to be regulating. Um, the next thing is with respect to um, N.5, uh, sorry, N5.2.2. Um, I assume that the way to handle this, which is idling, is idling while parked. And if you simply add the phrase while parked, it makes perfect sense and works fine. With respect to N5.3.3, uh, which is health impacts of particulate emissions and providing information about the steps that can take to remove, reduce particulate emissions, uh, isn't this being handled by the, uh, the Air District? I know if there are things deleted on the next page, um, uh, on N37 on the track changes version about wood fire, wood burning stoves and things like that. So I'm wondering if some reference to the Air District makes sense or if this policy is still something that we're doing. Uh, going up a little higher with respect to N5.3, there's a mention of leaf blowers. People seem to be all up in arms about the particulate matters of the leaf blower machines and completely, completely ignoring the fact that leaf blowers blow dust from the dirt, from the ground, and that dust is as much of a problem uh, whether the leaf blowers are electric or, ga or, 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 uh, or f fossil fuel powered, that dust that lingers in the air and is a hazard in, in and of itself. Um, finally, with respect to concentrated solar thermal. Uh, the issues with respect to concentrated thermal th solar thermal are not merely affecting wildlife. There is a current large project, concentrated solar thermal, I think it's called Tanapa. I may, not, I may not have that cor name correct. But in particular, this is, this is touted as being solar power. And as such, it basically says it is greenhouse gas free. That is not correct. It heats up during the day. And at night, it has to stay warm. They use natural gas to keep it heated overnight. So that in the morning, when the sun comes on, it can heat up and use, generate power. So this is not the kind of greenhouse gas-free energy that the city of Palo Alto should be buying. 
And therefore, I would suggest that we do include the prohibition for concentrated solar thermal unless and until it is truly greenhouse gas free without the, without the use of uh, fossil fuels to, to create heat for, for during, during nighttime hours. Um, and, and so I think that that's something that we should do because if we're gonna have 100% greenhouse gas free electric utility, buying concentrated solar thermal power does not generate greenhouse gas free power. Um, also, one final thing um, is there was a mention of uh, various kinds of things in terms of, I think it was uh, Amy Sung mentioned about various incentives for retrofits. Um, it is interesting that the City of Palo Alto Utilities re uh, incentive program seems to be very targeted. You get incentives for doing an X, or you get incentives for doing a Y, where those are specifically targeted for what it is. You get incentives certain, time, certain times for putting in s s solar thermal, um, water heaters. Um, but you don't get incentives for putting in uh, solar, uh, for, for improving uh, certain water uh, heating. So for example, if you use solar thermal water space heating, you don't get incentives for that. That's kind of silly. Um, in PG&E territory, they have this idea that you measure the energy usage of the home before you retrofit. You measure the energy usage of the home after the retrofit. And if your improvement exceeds a certain threshold, you get a lump of money. Um, and that's a much better strategy, I think, than our approach uh, which is this targeted in, in balkanized ways. And I think we should explore what other ut electric and, and, and what other uh, um, investor owned utilities do in terms of their incentive programs and think about copying some of that in, uh, in, in that regard. Uh, I also think that we need to, in order to promote solar power, uh, we need to think about um, a time of use metering. Um, and solar power is, it works with time of use metering, and we explored it, but not for those with elect without. We explored time of use meetings for those with electric vehicles, but not if you have solar power. But if you have solar power and electric and, and uh, time of use and, and and photovoltaics, you can get time of use metering in, in investor-owned utilities and PG&E territories. So I think we should include that and consider that, uh, because that I think will promote energy efficiency. And if you think about when the wind blows, where it, we're buying more and more wind power, the wind blows at night. And therefore, we want to promote energy use at night and energy saving during the day, uh, notwithstanding the duck's belly uh, chart. I've seen, people have seen that. Anyway, thank you. Um, Dory, did you have something else? Oh, I'm sorry, Steve. And then Dory. If it's red, I guess it's on. Um, I want to follow up on what Elaine said way back at the beginning. It's on N43, it's 8111. It's about what the sustainable community strategy means. I don't need to change the language at this point, but it does go to something that we talked about way early in the process, that at the end, Hillary, I hope we're going to write about how elements are connected. Okay. Um, I work for three regional planning agencies and two air quality agencies. I think I have this right, but Elaine and Joanna and Hillary, if I muck it up, jump in at the end, please. The sustainable community strategy has two pieces. It sets regional greenhouse gas emission reduction targets. And it requires that within each region, enough housing is provided to match the job and population growth. It's the other meaning of sustainability. That doesn't mean a lot per se, but what Elaine said is really important because land use and transportation, housing and transportation in the right place for every agency I work for is one of the major greenhouse gas emission and climate change adaptation policies. It's not some 
abstract thing. And if anybody on council doesn't get that, if we don't communicate that through the document, for example, by understanding that the land use element and the housing element are part of a greenhouse gas reduction policy along with the transportation element, I think that's a mistake. So I really want to support what Elaine said. That confers with my professional knowledge. If you see it any different, please jump in because it's more important to get it right. But I think sometimes people see that and think it's only about greenhouse gases. It's only one way. It's only regulation or stuff. And I think it really is housing and transportation also. Uh, Doria. Just um, very quickly, I wanted to respond to some of the comments. And we tried to distinguish between between channelized creeks and natural creeks, but we wanted to uh, make sure that pe that we maintain a uh, concept of even the channelized creeks provide habitat for animals. And on creeks, again, the 150-foot setback for the creeks is actually the county standard, and that's why it was added as a option. Um, some things that a couple people have mentioned, specific technologies and practices, we didn't include because they are part of the Green Building Code, which will evolve as things evolve and change. Um, and I agree with Whitney that we need to make it clear that we weren't trying to tell Stanford what to do on the whole entire campus. That wasn't our intention. And getting back to her map com comment, I think it's in general hard to evaluate the maps because they're so small. So I hope at some time we could get a full size version. Um, and uh, Arthur was ab absolutely right. It was um, stopped cars, it was not idling cars in traffic. We didn't think we could do anything about that. So, and then I appreciate comment about. Um, strengthening street tree protection and urban forest. And um, I also agree that we should prohibit concentrated solar thermal. That's it. Uh, I have a couple comments, and Arthur also wants to uh, talk. Um, I wasn't going to speak on this, but oh, and Don. Right. Uh, trees. Uh, I agree that street trees should be essentially required. Uh, they are very important for the character of our neighborhoods, for our streets. They play a very important uh, part in the identity of our town. I have a slightly different take, which I think is more aligned with Julie's relative to trees that are on my personal property. And I've talked about this before, where I think in the residential neighborhoods, the weight on the scale should be in favor of the individual homeowner. And so I have a hard time giving my neighbors appeal power over my decision of what I do with my trees and my property. I'm not talking about uh, the trees that are uh, protected, but just in general. That much said, let me move on to my uh, other topics. Um, tomorrow night, in addition uh, th with the Services and uh, Policy Committee, the um, we're also going to lay out very briefly a policy framework for thinking about uh, uh, the conservation of groundwater. Uh, and if the goal is ultimately the conservation of groundwater, then there are several policies that I think the city should think about uh, pursuing. Um, and this is not to uh, uh, compete with the county's auspice over these issues. But I think the city can do a number of things to support that, that goal. For instance, uh, reduction of existing extraction sources. There are many in the city. Uh, they are from underpasses and buildings primarily. Uh, but that is something that we can control and that we can uh, legislate and regulate. Uh, reduction of groundwater depletion due to construction. That includes buildings in addition, in addition to single family homes. Utilization of surface groundwater. Where, surface, where groundwater is surfaced, we should do our, make our best efforts to utilize that in a beneficial way and not simply pour it down the drain back into the bay. Uh, there are a variety of ways that are being explored, but we should be more proactive about that. Uh, we should also be exploring, presumably with the county and others, groundwater recharge. Uh, we've talked about a number of those issues in here, uh, but there are at least four or five different programs I can imagine that would directly support uh, those sorts of activities. Um, and then there's, of course, the coordination with municipalities, et cetera. 
but I would actually look to slightly reorganize the groundwater policy N 4.7 and start with, at the top, our goal of conservation of Palo Alto's groundwater and then let everything else fall out underneath that. Um, the, uh, 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 I am comfortable with policy 4.8 uh, because uh, we'll be talking about that in much greater detail at the regulatory level tomorrow, and we'll have other things. There may be some learnings that uh, come out of that that could influence the comp plan uh, later, but that can be added in you know, at the council level, level or uh, even by us if we wanted to. And then finally, under water quality and stormwater management, one of the things that we've learned in uh, the work that, uh, uh, and the calculations that uh, Keith and I have been working on is the degree to which soil absorption of water, uh, how important that is to our environment. It acts as a buffer for flooding. Uh, and it's one of the key things that uh, helps us mitigate that. It operates very much the way that uh, wetlands do. Uh, and that is something that probably should find its way into policy 4.9. Uh, we don't understand entirely how those soils work, but we do know uh, we, we have a rough idea of their uh, capacity and their ability to buffer the impacts uh, when there are storm surges, et cetera. Uh, that's it. Arthur and then Don. Uh, Don, please. Um, just, just quickly on the uh, uh, on the tree on private property issue, I'm, I'm sort of between should you, shouldn't you. I, I think the elephant in the room is Castilea coming out and saying we've got 168 trees we're going to get rid of. Um, and is that on private property and not on private property and, and huge redwoods? And, and should people have the opportunity to speak out about that or not, I think. And, and therefore, I lean in the direction of allowing some sort of uh, appeal, especially if it's any kind of protected tree. I think the other issue about that, and I've mentioned this before, is the issue of transparency. We've talked a lot about you know trees being in public, uh, on the the public divides and and so on. Uh, the the city took out three trees in front of our house a year and a half ago. Um, I have no visibility of whether they're ever going to plan on replacing those or not. And uh, since my neighbor uh, won't fix his uh, his irrigation system and he irrigates the mud every day, uh, it's it's. Uh, it's it's a it's a problem. Um, the uh, I, I want to mention Shawnee again. I think she had a, a really positive impact uh, with with this uh, um, and her experience with other uh, communities up and down the the bay. That that was why the 150 foot. Uh, she knew that that was a county regulation number one, and she was also aware of what uh, places like San San Jose were doing, even with concrete creeks, uh, and the and the importance of that. And the same thing with the pollination routes and that map. Um, Whitney mentioned it looked like it went through buildings and parking lots. And I think the pollination route was not necessarily um, a creek route or something. It was it was a concept of where where pollination would uh, would happen. Um, and uh, I want to re reinforce what Steve said about the sustainable. Um, People said, heard me say sustainable enough during, <laughs> during the campaign over and over again. Uh, but it's, it's sustainability and the connectedness of things. It's the connection of the various kinds of sustainability. In fact, it really comes down, and we haven't done the business one yet, to what uh, are the three E's. It's the social equity and the, and the economy and the environment that are connected. And I hope in the end that we can, as a comprehensive plan, connect all three of those. I think that would be really important. Thank you. Uh, Hillary. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to make sure everyone knew that uh, Shawnee had sent her apologies. She was uh, going to have to go to the San Jose City Council this evening to represent the Audubon Society, so she wasn't able to make it. And Arthur. Um, so firstly, um, I think that uh, Don McDougall is right about the need for being able to peel trees. And I don't understand the idea why somebody should not be able to appeal a street, a, a, a tree on private property when they can appeal 
individual review second stories on private property. They can review all sorts of other, ki appeal all kinds of other things on private property developments. So what's special about trees that they should not be able to appeal that? It makes no sense to me. So if they can appeal anything, they should be able to appeal the, the removal of trees, especially protected trees. Um, I also agree with Don McDougall's point about, um, about street trees. I had, a, I had a tree removed from my front of my house, street tree, because it died. And I said, good, dig out the stump, put a new one in. And the city said, no, we can't, because it's within five feet of a water, a water meter and a water line. And so put some other tree in there. Now notice that I can actually put a tree. This is this. I, I'm in, I'm in the part of this the, the uh, Palo Alto that has rolling curbs, and therefore this tree is behind the curb. And then there's a property line with a fence there. And then on my side of the property line, I feel I can feel free to put a tree in exactly in this uh, two feet away from where the city refuses to put one in. That's kind of crazy, and then that needs to be improved. That we need to think about better ways. After all, uh, Dave Docker has this idea of structural soil. Why can't we use structural soil kind of techniques for being able to dig out the stump and put it in so that the tree, the tree uh, roots go down away from uh, the uh, water meter? Uh, finally, I appreciate uh, Steve Levy bringing up sustainable community strategy in SB 375. And I heard him talk a lot about transportation, land use, housing. I didn't hear him talk anything about jobs. And what seems to me, uh, except the idea that, that the, 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 the housing needs to be created in order to satisfy the needs for jobs. Uh, Why I've let. Say that? Well, in any event, well. No. Well, hang on. Hang on. Hang on. Don't get to Ms. Crump. Well, you can. I, I, sorry, you have I missed. I, 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 your comments and we'll yeah, you, bring it you may you. respond. I, I, sorry if I misquoted you. I think that, that you mentioned the idea of creating housing, but I don't think you mentioned the idea of limiting jobs. And one of the things about this is that I know that Steve has lived here for decades, and so have I. And I've lived here seeing recession, boom, recession, boom. And we've had a pretty much a boom uh, for a lot since uh, the last recession in the early 90s. And what's happened in previous booms is that uh, we've had expansions within, uh, Palo, within, the, within the Silicon Valley. And uh, those expansions have invol involved relocations out of the valley of what's happened. So we, you know, we had disk drives used to be created here, and now disk drives are moved into construction elsewhere, and now they're overseas. We had construction of, sil of, of, of silicon uh, generating you know, m manufacturer equipment, and then that was moved elsewhere out of the valley. And now we have a boom in terms of software. And the software is be creating here, and we're basically creating more and more intensification within Silicon Valley. And we don't have the same kind of thing about relocating uh, so that expansion happens elsewhere. And so what we're winding up with is cities like, for example, Menlo Park you know, said, oh, well, all the other cities are expanding jobs. We want to have our share of expanding jobs. And so what's happening is that they're expanding jobs fast. They're, sure, they're expanding housing, but they're expanding ho jobs faster than they're expanding housing. And the same thing with Mountain View. Mountain View is expanding housing, but they're expanding jobs in terms of what's going on with Google and LinkedIn and whatever faster than they're expanding housing. So the issue is that in some sense, what we need to think about is, yes, we do need to create more housing. But as a region, we need to basically say we need to slow down on creating jobs. And yes, companies, you need to create these, some of these jobs elsewhere and figure out, spread the wealth in other communities. And I think that that's part of the issue of what we need to do in terms of sustainable community strategy. It's balancing transportation, housing, and jobs. And that means not simply putting your foot on the scale of jobs, which is what we've been doing much too much, especially in the last few years in Palo Alto, but moderating on jobs and, in, and, and increasing them, uh, and basically increasing housing. And that's the kind of balance I think we need to do. Also in terms of transportation, our transportation infrastructure is not keeping up with this either. Thank you. Bon, hang on.
Bonnie's first, then you, Steve, I'm sorry. She was. I want to say that I think that uh, the last few comments of our uh, co chair were, were, were rather out of line and uh, not part of our, the, the subject matter of, of this element. And, uh, and you, you know, it would just. Well, anyway, I'm not going to go into the reasons why I totally disagree with your concept about jobs. But I do want to uh, underscore what Elaine and Steve said about cross-referencing. And I did say in my written comments that in this, the introductory part about climate change referred to the transportation element. And yes, the land use element, too, because we do talk about uh, locating um, you know, concentrations of people, whether it's jobs or housing, near transit, because that, that has uh, another effect on sustainability. I mean, it's all interrelated. Um, and uh, going back to the minutia of street trees, I hope that whole issue of appeals is not uh, worked out here in this comp plan. That's an issue for the city council and a larger group of people uh, to weigh in on in a public hearing. Just think, consider it. And that's it. And it isn't our job to decide what, what's appropriate or not appropriate as far as that appeals process. But I might recommend, since I did bring up the issue of de defining street, tree, street trees, that maybe the city have more of an education about street trees, what the city's role is, and what a private person's role is, because it's totally confusing. There isn't, uh, the city's done a poor job in, in that communication of that area. So um, communication about uh, respective responsibilities with regard to our urban forest might be a useful high-level uh, program policy kind of thing in, in the comp plan, because we should keep it high-level. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Um, Hillary, I, I remember way back when you said at the very end, um, I don't know, the staff, I guess, would write about the connections between the elements. As I look down here, unless that's somehow in the intro or the user guide, I don't see any place in the upcoming steps. And I, I think a number of us think that some of those connections are are really important. So is that something you're planning to do? Uh, yes, that's a, that's a good point. I think we had already always anticipated that that conversation would start in our review of the implementation section. Okay. So we're going to look at all of the programs from all the elements. And then the last meeting where we have talked about okay. I just wanted just to, sort of to taking make sure. stock, we'll, okay. we'll talk about what those relationships are. Look, I suspect that Arthur and I have very different visions for the region. I was trying to share what I know, asking the staff to step in about what the law and the implementation of the sustainable community strategy means. If Arthur disagrees with that, that's his disagreement. I was trying to do an explanation, and I think I'm correct, okay? So in our region, we have are about to have an adopted plan by ABAG that actually increases the targets for jobs in population because that's what the experts, and I didn't do this one, that's what the experts think is happening. In that plan, the integration of housing and transportation is absolutely critical to the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions and the protection of the climate. That's all I'm saying. If Arthur wants the region to grow differently, as Bonnie said, that's a different topic than what I was talking about. And again, I'll ask Hillary and Joanna and Elaine, have I said anything wrong? Because I kind of do this for a living. Yeah, l let, me, uh, let me weigh in. I, I think uh, going back to Elaine's original comment, I think that was right on. Uh, we've referenced the sustainable community strategies here, and it was, um, in this sense of trying to talk about climate change and climate adaptation, but the way the regional agencies think about this, it is about the integration of land use and transportation. Yeah. So and so we can try and draw out that theme in this reference okay. uh, and be more complete mm -hmm. in our, in our uh, program here. Thank you. Okay. 
Thank you all. Uh, I'm not seeing any more cards up. Um, Dan, yes. I'm sorry if I may. I just wanted to provide a little clarification on this on the tree issue. Just, I, I, it's just basically to state that um, we draw a distinction between trees on single family lots versus anything else. So for any type of development, commercial, industrial, <laughs> or multifamily, we do regulate trees. So the removal of a tree would be a modification to a land, an approved landscaping plan. So that is something that is regulated. We issue permits and that is um, appealable um, through our process. What is different for single family <laughs> lots is that we do not regulate non-protected trees within backyards. Um, and so that's, I think that's the question that was being discussed by the subcommittee. So that would be the specific change that would occur um, if this was further um, explored by the city council. And also to also to mention that the city does regulate street trees um, and we do require street trees as part of developments. I, I'm sorry. Okay. We good to go? Sure. Um, I would love to hear a motion to move this element going forward by one of the subcommittee members. You so move. Is there a second? Doria seconds. Are there any friendly or unfriendly amendments that might be offered? Bonnie? A friendly amendment, as we did with the safety element, that what we send forward includes uh, the relevant comments and the changes that were recommended by by what, by what you by sensed was a consensus of the committee. And, and also, and also the uh, minutes of the meeting, and people can submit comments up to a week from today. Ham Hamilton, did you have a comment there? Yeah, I was just going to add the word corrections, but Bonnie got it covered. So. Okay. So with that, would those that uh, support the motion please raise your hand and say aye. Aye. All opposed? None showing. No, any abstentions? No abstentions. It passes unanimously. Thank you very much. Um, what else? Do we possibly have to talk about this evening? <laughs> Thanks for the food. Yes, yes thank you for the food. Yes, and please note the next meeting date, uh, January 17th, and we'll send out a calendar reminder for all of the 2017 meetings. So they're January, February, March, April. They're on the thing. Oh, yeah. yeah. We'll all right, folks. And thank Lisa for the chocolate. Yay. Yay. Uh, yeah, and if anyone is not able to join us on those dates, please let us know. Uh, but with that, uh, we are adjourned. <laughs>